Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all its people. Lord, we ask that you guide us in the decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to Elders past and present. Please be seated. Councillors, I declare the meeting open. Are there any apologies? Councillor Hutton. Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor Landers will be absent today and I move that she be granted a leave of absence for the meeting. May I please have a seconder? Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that Councillor Landers be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. There being no further apologies, councillors, I draw to your attention the motion of special appreciation at item to, uh, two of the agenda. Lord Mayor, would you please move the motion? Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, I move that this council acknowledges and commemorates the 10th anniversary of the sister city relationship between Brisbane and the city of Hyderabad, India. Sister city arrangements continue to build significant civic and cultural ties between cities and foster relationships through sporting, educational and social exchanges, as well as deliver, uh, developing links through tourism, trade and business. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the motion as written is moved. Is there any debate, the Lord Mayor? Thank you, Mr Chair. Well, as the uh, motion uh, points out, uh, today we're acknowledging and celebrating uh, the 10th anniversary of the sister city relationship between Brisbane and the city of Hyderabad in India. The sister city relationship uh, was signed on the 5th of October 2010 uh, as part of the Lord Mayoral Business Mission held in that year. Uh, and it's quite an interesting one because it is a tripartite arrangement. It's not just between the, sister, uh, the cities of Brisbane and Hyderabad, but it's also between uh, the dual cities in Australia, Brisbane and Ipswich, uh, and also the city of Hyderabad. And so that is quite a unique one when it comes to our sister city arrangements. It's been between two local Australian cities here and uh, our sister city in Hyderabad. Hyderabad is the capital of the largest city of the Indian state uh, of uh, Telangana, and it's also uh, located on the Deccan Plateau uh, along the banks of the Musi River in the northern part of southern India. It has an estimated population of around 10 million people. So uh, once again, uh, as with uh, a number of our sister cities, significantly larger city than Brisbane um, and uh, 10 million people uh, makes it the fourth largest city in India. So a very significant and important city in India and therefore an important city in the entire Asia Pacific region, an important city uh, for us as a city to have a relationship with. Uh, Hyderabad is known for its rich, rich history, uh, its incredible food, its multilingual culture uh, and was founded as a city in 1591. I'll say that again, 1591. Uh, so an incredibly ancient city, um, uh, an incredible amount of history and culture in that city. Uh, and it's also a city that has a tropical climate. Uh, so uh, the city of Hyderabad um, was a major pearl processing and trading hub until the 19th century uh, and gave it the name of the city of pearls. Uh, Hyderabad is well placed as a financial hub and has attracted major research, manufacturing, uh, pharmaceutical and biotech companies to be located there. And particularly as, as a result of India's IT revolution, uh, Hyderabad became uh, effectively a cyber city um, and was leading the way and has led the way in terms of uh, India's transition to that high-tech cyber economy. Uh, and uh, it is um, doing incredibly well in that respect. Hyderabad's also uh, a major hub for film production. Now we've all heard of Bollywood um, but Hyderabad is actually the home of Tollywood uh, which is uh, particularly um, linked to uh, a particular language in uh, the Indian culture, uh, Telungu, and that 
particular uh, language has its own set of films and film industry associated with it. And in fact, it is home to the world's biggest film city. Uh, so we know uh, we have in, the, in uh, Hollywood um, and in uh, Los Angeles an incredible film industry located there. Well, this in scale is bigger than Hollywood. Um, so Tollywood is bigger than Hollywood. Um, and that film city spreads across 2,000 acres of land. Uh, it's also a popular tourism and recreation centre uh, that attracts many visitors a year, almost 1.5 million visitors in a normal year. Following the uh, 2014 Lord Merrill uh, business mission to Hyderabad, um, the uh, relationship was ses uh, successfully uh, expa expanded between uh, the two cities and that is something we remain absolutely committed to doing, to expanding and growing this relationship to the benefit, the mutual benefit of both cities and in fact the three cities involved including uh, Ipswich as well. I did want to uh, shout out as well, um, in the gallery we have uh, Raywin Bailey, who is our representative on the Sister City Steering Committee for Hyderabad and other members of uh, the great team that we have uh, fostering the relationship between our cities. Uh, and I wanted to pay tribute uh, to their work in making sure that there is ongoing cultural, tourism and business exchanges between our two cities and that the relationship continues to go from strength to strength. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I just want to take this opportunity to support uh, the motion of appreciation before us today and thank our wonderful sister city, Hyderabad, and commemorate our ongoing relations. Brisbane's relationship with Hyderabad is strong and prosperous uh, and has only been strengthened over the last decade, building many cultural and economic ties. Having a sister city like Hyderabad is an asset to the city of Brisbane, giving us opportunities to trade, uh, do business and hopefully build tourism links when we are back to some form of normality. Uh, Intercity relations are very important and let's hope our bond with Hyderabad continues to grow. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise in support of this motion of appreciation for our sister city agreement that we have now celebrated 10 years with Hyderabad. For many of the new councillors in this place, they may not be aware that this was an unusual sister city agreement. It was the first sister city process that went out to the locally based Indian community for their contribution in the selection of the sister city. So we started off with nominations from many people across all areas of India who are based here in Brisbane and they cut that down to 13 cities. We then shortlisted out of those 13 cities to four, which were Chennai, Jaipur, <coughs> Hyderabad and Lucknow. And after much deliberation, we settled on Hyderabad because of the synergies Hyderabad has with Brisbane. Having the involvement of the Brisbane-based Indian community was very important. It was a commitment that I gave in the 2008 election that I would work towards establishing with then Lord Mayor Campbell Newman a sister city arrangement with an Indian sister city. And this is something that this administration on this side of the chamber has delivered and will continue to work on. It is very important with our sister cities that we foster in so many ways, not only arts and culture, but also mutually beneficial trade outcomes. Now, I have hosted here delegations from Telangana, and it has been wonderful to experience the interactions that we have had. Also, as the Lord Mayor has explained, this was the first ever tripartite sister city agreement. And I think that that is significant because it reflects that the Indian community here in the southeast corner of Queensland is not just solely based in Brisbane, but it does extend right across the southwest corridor. For those people who live in Springfield, they will know how strong the Indian community is out there as well. I am fortunate to have spent a lot of time over the past decade working on the relationships with many different multicultural communities. And can I say, I am proud 
of the relationship that we have developed as a city with Hyderabad. And I do extend my thanks to the sister city representatives who are here with us today, who are sitting up in the gallery, Mrs Raywan Bailey, who is the Hyderabad representative, and Mr Anthony Lin, who is the Kaohsiung representative. Because during my time as chairman of the sister cities committee, that I know no. how hard that they have worked in their own time to make sure that they have enhanced the relationships. I know that they have travelled to those cities to take delegations to accompany <coughs> former Lord Mayors to those cities to make sure that we enhance all of the connections. And can I say a very special thank you for all of your efforts as well during the Asia Pacific, Pacific Cities Summit, because I know that when we had the delegations here in Brisbane, that you took a lot of your own personal time out of your day-to-day -day business and you invested it in our city for the, the sole purpose of enhancing those relationships. So it's with great pleasure today, Mr Chair, that I rise in support of this motion of appreciation, not only for what has happened in this city, but also to all of those in Hyderabad who have made this working relationship prosper. Thank you. Further speakers? The Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and I too stand in support of the motion of appreciation that acknowledges and commemorates the 10th anniversary of our sister city relationship. As mentioned by both the previous speakers on this side, we've had a long history with uh, India and it was fantastic to see that signed in October 2010 uh, with Hyderabad. It was a, a big t uh, choice between the cities. They, it was hotly contested, if I remember, who would get to be sister cities with Ipswich and Brisbane at the time. But we're very happy to have that relationship with Hyderabad. Raywan Bailey, who's in the, uh, the chambers with us this afternoon, has been the sister city representative for Hyderabad for all that time. And can I also acknowledge uh, Mr Jordan Ascoon that is here this afternoon. He's the winner of the Lord Mayor's Young and Emerging Artist Grant. And he's got a grant to actually do a project to celebrate this 10th anniversary uh, for the Hyderabad uh, sister cities relationship. So in January, he got that uh, artist, artist fellowship and the proposal was to create a sculpture to celebrate the 10-year anniversary. It's still, I understand, Jordan, in research and planning stages due to a few travel con uh, restrictions at this time, uh, but we're looking forward to seeing how that develops over the coming months as well. And we'll continue on this program, whether it's Hyderabad or any other of our sister city students within Brisbane, uh, to support them. As well as that, we've got the inter International Internship Program, which Hyderabad has always had students involved in that. And actually, this year for 2020, we've got... Uh, three students uh, from Hyderabad that are involved in being placed in Brisbane companies to not only learn about Brisbane business, but also to share their experience on how to do business in India with those local businesses as well. So right through our international relations program, sister cities, internships, multicultural business awards coming up, the Lord Mayor's Multicultural Roundtable, we are focusing on still helping small to medium enterprises, our international students and fostering those relationships so we can, we can grow not only our domestic but our international markets as well. So congratulations and it's been a pleasure to work with Hyderabad over the years. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. The Lord Mayor. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the confirmation of minutes, please. Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,630th meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the minutes of the 4,630th meeting of Council held on the 20th of October 2020 be received, taken as read and confirmed. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Councillors, I draw to your attention item four, the public participant. Can I please invite Mrs. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rebecca Olkers into the chamber who will discuss the Brisbane Housing Company's achievements and their contribution to Brisbane's growth and recovery. Welcome, Ms. Olkers. Just, just wait a moment, we'll just, the microphone's on. You have uh, five minutes to commence when you begin. Please. Mr Chair, Lord Mayor and Councillors, 
Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Olkers and I'm the CEO of Brisbane Housing Company. And BHC is a charity. We operate in Brisbane. We're one of the largest affordable housing companies in Australia. And thank you so much um, and thank you for the, for the support that BCC has given us over the last uh, 18 years. We were actually established in 2002 and since this period of time and since the $10 million grant that you actually gave us back in 2002, we've actually been able to amass a portfolio of around 1,700 properties across Brisbane to house people in low and very low income brackets and really help support their lives. So I want to say a very heartfelt thank you for that investment all of that time ago and our appreciation for that. We really, really value the relationship that we have with Brisbane City Council and we are most appreciative. As an ordinary shareholder in BHC, Council has played a very, very important role and this opportunity to work with BHC to ensure that Brisbane residents have a safe and secure place to call home is extremely necessary in our city of Brisbane. Um, what I would like to say is that during this pandemic time, the importance of a roof over your head has even been more important. And I, I can tell you from my heart that the tenants that I know and that I see are very appreciative of that home. But what I'm here today to talk with you about is actually the progress that we've made through the Pathways Out of Homelessness grant the BCC has been so gracious to um, grant to us, to BHC. So I'm here really on behalf of BHC and also our partners, Communify and Brick Housing, to tell you of some of the successes that we've had, because this has truly been a life-changing project for the people who have been recipients of this program. So even though this program has only been in operation for the past three months, really since the end of July, it has been life-changing for people. So far, there have been 67 residents of both Brick and BHC that have been able to um, partake in this program. So basically what happens is that we refer people to Communify and Communify is able to provide wraparound services for our tenants who might otherwise really, really struggle with their tenancies and who may not like succeed in their tenancies. So I want to tell you, um, there's, there's so many stories, there's 67 different stories. But I'm going to tell you just a couple this, this afternoon. So the first one is um, around Stephen. Now Stephen was a tenant of Brisbane Housing Companies. He's a man in his 50s. Um, during a scheduled inspection, Stephen was actually found on the floor crying. He was crying because of the exhaustion. He was trying to get his house ready for the inspection and he just couldn't do it. He'd actually experienced a stroke in April. He'd been hospitalised but due to COVID, He'd actually been um, discharged from hospital, probably without the supports that he really needed. His mental health was escalating and he also had agoraphobia. So even though Stephen was a long-term tenant of BHC, he was really, really struggling to keep that tenancy going. So because of the grant the BCC has given to us, we were actually able to, um, to refer him to Communify and to our partners. And during that period of time, which is just three weeks ago, the kinds of supports that we've been able to place for Stephen have been life-changing. So, we've been referred, he's been referred. Since that time, he is now receiving weekly two-hour visits from a support worker to assist with his home-based tasks. He's received an occupational therapy review. He's received a mental health review for his medication, and these needed to be changed to actually help him. He wasn't getting this support before because his supports had actually fallen away. Without this grant, he wouldn't have received this. NDIS funding has been sought. This man is actually eligible for NDIS, but he didn't know it. And nobody had helped him to actually fill the paperwork out to do it. He now has that sorted. The brokerage funding that you provided enables some cleans of his property. So actually just getting that property back into a position where he could then maintain it from that point was a really big um, benefit for him. He has some new glasses. He'd, he'd actually wrecked his glasses. He couldn't read properly. He now has some new glasses. He's been connected with the New Farm Neighbourhood Centre so that he can wash his clothes and actually get some nutritious food. They're really basic things, but that has made a massive difference to him and to his life. He's also now been connected with his family in New Zealand through the ability to access an iPad. So you can probably see that all of these things have absolutely changed his life. And this is just one story. The other story I wanted to share with you was a young man whose name is Jake, 22-year-old, moving out of home for the first time but living with an acquired brain injury. 
he, has actually, um, he actually came to live in our Green Square property, which was a property that was built on council land, I might add. Um, he initially, our, our housing manager just thought, this person is going to have some issues in adapting. She referred him directly. And not only has he the supports, the life skill supports that he needs to know how to properly look after his unit, but the workforce participation grant, um, part of the grant has actually assisted him to do a Cert two in business, and he starts his first job this coming Friday. Um, so Ms Olkers, I'm going to have to apologise because the, the, what we were saying was very important, but um, the rules only allow a five minute presentation, and um, I'm going to have to ask you to stop at this point, but th thank you for taking the time to come in and talk about these things. Uh, could I please invite, I think, Councillor Howard to respond? Thank you. Well, thank you, Chair, and uh, can I particularly thank Ms Olkers for her presentation. And uh, Rebecca, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, I know that your work as a CEO with BHC is just going to continue the fantastic work that they've been doing for many years. And I know that Brisbane City Council has been very proud to partner with you since 2002, and long may that continue. Um, it was fantastic for you also to launch our Inclusive Brisbane Strategy Plan. And, and I know that uh, the Lord Mayor and, and Councillor Matic before me uh, worked very hard to get the Pathways Out of Homelessness grant um, on board. And we saw that as such an important um, grant we, we really are so thrilled that so many organisations have collaborated with each other and the work that you're doing with Communify is just a perfect example of what we felt that that grant could do. And we very much felt that the grant was about helping people not just to get a roof over their head, but to have those wraparound services and to know that that would lead hopefully to a job. And uh, I think the Lord Mayor and uh, some of my colleagues are very tired of hearing me say how important it is to find a job. It's the, uh, it's the thing I think that uh, we really need to work so hard towards. And I know that this uh, Pathways Out of Homelessness program is working really very successfully in that area in that we have a lot of organisations who have, as I said, collaborated. So to hear the success of Stephen and Jake, and uh, we're sorry that we couldn't hear all of the stories, but uh, I know I've been to the Communify News Centre that they've just opened, and I know what a difference that that is making to our vulnerable people right across Brisbane. So it's fantastic the work that BHC does. We, uh, we are very proud to have partnered with you. We very much looking forward to doing a lot more work and, and absolutely thrilled to hear the successes of the Pathway Out of Homelessness grant. So thank you very much for being here this afternoon. Thank you, thank you Ms Olkers. Uh, Mr Pearce will assist you. Point of order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Last week you indicated you were seeking legal advice about the procedure for voting. Um, have you sought this legal advice and can you provide it to all councillors? I can. I, I don't have it in writing at hand, but the advice I received on that day, uh, there was three separate pieces of advice. Um, and the final one that I believe to be the correct one is that section 242E3 reflects in committee meetings alone. There was advice that that section was for the council, but is, that is only relevant to committee. So it does not reflect actions in this meeting. All right, councillors, I will now uh, draw point, your attention point of to... Order, Mr Chairman. Yes, Councillor Sorry, Johnston. just to be clear then, there are no changes to the meeting's local law. They are just to committee. On that particular item that I mentioned, 242E3, that only reflects upon the committee proceedings. All right, councillors, question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or a chair of any standing committees? Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, we are proud of this administration's track record when it comes to delivering infrastructure and maintaining a balanced budget. As we've now reached another milestone with the completion of the Kingsford Smith upgrade, drive upgrade, delivered well under budget, can you outline what this saving will mean for the ratepayers of Brisbane? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hutton, for the question. And indeed, it is an exciting day. Uh, it is a day where we have re reached yet another important infrastructure milestone in our city, the delivery of 
what is effectively the largest and most complex road project ever undertaken by Brisbane City Council. Obviously, we've delivered a range of bridges and tunnels, but in terms of uh, road upgrades, this is the largest and most complicated. And it was delivered not only on budget, but under budget. And because it was delivered under budget, that saving will be paid now directly to the ratepayers of Brisbane. All ratepayers, more than 500,000 of them across Brisbane, will share in those savings. The $15 million in savings uh, will go to reduce the rate accounts of more than 500,000 people and ratepayers across the city. And uh, this is a fantastic outcome for our city. I can confirm today that when you take into account the six-month rate freeze, which I announced in the recent budget, and when you take into account the reduction in rates of around $30, it'll be $29 and uh, various cents. We're just uh, finalising that figure. But when you take into account that, actually $29 and 24 cents to be precise, that uh, impact on the rate bill, the average rate bill for residential uh, categories right across Brisbane, and when I say res residential categories, I mean all residential categories, owner-occupiers, uh, non-owner-occupiers, CTS, all residential categories, the average rate bill across the year when compared to last year will go down. The first time in living memory that rates have reduced in any year for residential property owners. This will be the first time, and I can tell you the figures. Uh, the average rate bill for all residential property owners in 1920, so last financial year, was $1,668.17. This year, in 2020, the average rate bill across all residential properties will be $1,659.90. A reduction in the rate bill across the year. That is the outcome of responsible financial management. That is the outcome of responsible project money, uh, management. A reduction in rate bills for the first time in living memory. Now, I know that we mentioned the first time in 34 or 35 years that there's a rate freeze. We have to go back even further to find a year where rates went down for residential properties across Brisbane. And that is a fantastic outcome. It's a tribute to everyone who has worked on this project, a tribute to Councillor McLaughlin, a tribute to Councillor Amanda Cooper, or the former Councillor Amanda Cooper and the next member for Aspley, a tribute to the project team in Council, a tribute to Lendlease and the 5,000 people that have worked on this project. 5,000 people. 5,000 people in recent times have gone home, they put food on their table because of this council's investment in infrastructure. And this investment is just the last, or the latest, not the last, it certainly won't be the last, of many important infrastructure projects. Going back to the Eleanor Chanel Bridge, the Go Between Bridge, Legacy Way, Clem 7, a whole range of other investments right across the city, in 15 years worth of suburban road upgrades, in uh, new sections of Riverwalk, whether it's the Botanic Gardens Riverwalk, uh, whether it's rebuilding the New Farm Riverwalk, or right now the Indrapilly Riverwalk, uh, or whether it's investing in new city cats, uh, new kitty cats in more recent times. Infrastructure has always been in our DNA. Building things has always been in our DNA. Our record of delivery speaks for itself, but one thing is apparent today. You cannot trust a word that Labor says when it comes to infrastructure. You cannot trust a word that Labor says when it comes to finances or project management. This is a team that amongst them has never managed a chook raffle, let alone a major project. And this is a project... Uh, Councillor Cook has managed a chook raffle, apparently. That's All OK. Right. That's OK. I stand corrected. All right. Councillors... Um, OK. okay. Councillors... Lord Mayor, please return to the uh, question. And if you look at the history of what Labor councillors have said about this project, KSD, let's go back to October last year. In writing, they claimed a $70 million cost blowout on Kingsford Smith Drive. Right there, Councillor Cassidy, on his Facebook, was claiming a $70 million cost blowout. And then, fast forward through to January this year, a $100 million blowout. There, Lord, on his Twitter account. Lord Mayor, uh, you, Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. 
My question is to the Lord Mayor. Residents in my ward and residents right across Brisbane are angry. They want curbside collection to be reinstated. The community has gotten so desperate, local businesses and organizations are now picking up the LNP slack. Just recently, I had the Anala Lions taking rubbish to the tip for elderly couples. Now, we, now we've got private companies doing their own curbside collection across Brisbane. It's clear residents want curbside collection back and you're not listening. You claim to have, uh, you claim to want to save money for the economic crisis, but you're still wasting millions of ratepayers' dollars on promoting yourself in council documents like living in Brisbane. Lord Mayor, why do you continue to ignore the needs of the, uh, of the city and instead of prioritizing and marketing yourself at the expense of ratepayers? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm not sure whether that was a question or just a political statement. Um, and he said it with such vigour and passion that he had to read out every word. And I can say here that uh, Council, in its responsible management of the financial situation and our budget, uh, we'll bring back curbside collection as soon as we can financially do so, as soon as it is responsible to do so. And I can... No, no, OK. Please allow, the, uh, please allow the answer to be heard, Lord Mayor. Well, it's important that we just get that comment on the record, because yeah. Councillor Strunk uh, just said, we just saved $15 million on Kingston Smith Drive. Apparently that's a change in the Labor narrative, because apparently the project is $100 million over budget, according to Councillor Cassidy and his fake news. Now, what is it? Is the project under budget or is it over budget? Councillor Strunk knows today. He's finally admitted that the project is under budget. Lord, Lord Mayor, can I ask you to address the question that was presented I'm to you, please? I'm just about yep. to. And that's an interesting point, because I wonder if Councillor Strunk is suggesting that instead of reducing rates for ratepayers, all ratepayers, uh, that that money should have been used for curbside collection. Is that what Councillor Strunk is suggesting? Because that would be a very interesting proposition indeed. Uh, because we know that while people do appreciate the once a year opportunity to take out the trash and put it on the curbside, uh, we know that right now the top priority is reducing and keeping down rate bills and the cost of living for people that are doing it tough. So if you gave people the opportunity, would you want some curbside collection once a year or would you want a reduction in your rate bill? I wonder what they would say. But obviously Labor is not is not con uh, Labor is obviously Council, not Lord Mayor, councillors, councillors, please allow. No, 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 no. That, just stop, please, Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Cassidy, that, that's just, mate. Why don't you, why don't you wait till general business if you're going to give a speech? Please keep interjections brief, um, and uh, please put some effort into them, um, but keep them short. Try to be interesting. Um, <laughs> Now, can I ask the Lord Mayor to address the question at hand, and can I remind all councillors the question was heard in silence. Please allow the answer to be heard in silence. Thank Lord you, Mayor. Mr Chair. And look, you know that the louder Councillor Cassidy squawks, the more he's hurting uh, and the more things aren't going his way. The, the more he tweets and trolls, the more he's hurting and the more things aren't going his way. And I tell you, he's been very busy this morning. He's hurting a lot. And, and the reason for that is he's been caught out in a lie in a bold-faced lie, telling fibs for at least the last couple of years on Kingston Smith Drive. Well, I'll point tell you of what, order, Mr Chair. Point of order uh, to you, Councillor Strunk. Yes. Can, can, can the Lord Mayor ask, ask, answer my question that I asked? It's nothing about no, I appreciate the Leader of, of the Opposition. No. It's all Councillor about curbside Strunk, collection. Thank you. I have... Uh, Councillor Strunk, I have... Uh, thank, can I please allow, uh, please allow me the time to address the point of order? Councillor Strunk, thank you for your point of order. Uh, as you would be aware, I have asked the Lord Mayor to come back to the question earlier, and I'll do so again, Lord Mayor, uh, please, to the question at hand. I think I have answered the question, which is we will bring back curbside collection as soon as it is financially responsible to do so, uh, and that will be as soon as we have the financial wherewithal, and it is the top of the priority list. Now, right now, the top of the priority list is keeping rates down. 
And as I just uh, explained before, this will be the first time in living memory that the average residential rate bill has gone down. Not just frozen, has gone down. Has gone down. The only, the only time in living memory that Can rates Councillor in Johnston. Brisbane City Council Johnston, have please. gone down across all residential categories for the average ratepayer. LMP, responsible financial management, delivering for ratepayers. And at the same time, continue to invest in major infrastructure projects that benefit the city, that benefit the future, that deliver a better Brisbane. That is our focus. But I will say again, as soon as we can bring back curbside collection responsibly, we will do so. But it's interesting to note, uh, and Councillor uh, Strunk has sort of mentioned that there are a number of other people stepping up uh, on, entrepreneurs stepping up to provide a free service to residents. So, uh, yeah, I know, he's, he's saying that as though it's a bad thing. This is a great thing. But heaven forbid, heaven forbid that the market will adapt and businesses will provide a free service to <laughs> residents. Lord Mayor, that is, Lord, that is a good thing. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is to the Chair of Infrastructure Committee, Councillor McLaughlin. Councillor McLaughlin, one of the administration's key projects have now been complete, with all lanes of traffic now open on Kingswood Smith Drive. Can you please give us the history of this project and how it will ease traffic congestion for the Portside area? Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair, and through you to Councillor Hammond for the question. Yes, indeed, I can confirm that today Kingston Smith Drive has reopened with three lanes along its entire length uh, open, uh, three outbound lanes and three inbound lanes at 60 kilometres an hour, and uh, just a, yet another example of us building a better Brisbane, Mr Chair. The, uh, the final and, in engineering terms, most complex section of this uh, project between Riverview Terrace and Cameron Rocks Reserve has been line marked on a top coat of freshly laid bitumen, which we saw today, but these last finishing touches are only a part of the KSD upgrade. This uh, has always been much more, uh, Mr Chair, than increasing the number of lanes for vehicles. Deep beneath the surface of KSD is a complex myriad of, of utility services, um, some of which date back, had dated back to the 1800s, and so this upgrade has involved replacing kilometres of water mains, gas, electricity and stormwater infrastructure, which has future-proofed the entire area and allows for future growth. Um, new urban amenity and green spaces were delivered, including a new park and plazas at Bretts Wharf and the rejuvenated Cameron Rocks Reserve. We can now enjoy the Brisbane River from the terraced steps of these precincts, from the new recreation hub and the Loris Bonny Riverwalk, which has seen a staggering over 800,000 cyclist and pedestrian trips since it opened in late 2018. Mr Chair, over 2,000 walkers and cyclists use this infrastructure each and every day, particularly at dawn and dusk, when there are spectacular views of the river that can be enjoyed. The uh, ride or walk from Bretts Wharf to Albion was a nightmare before this project, and only the brave or foolhardy tried it. I did try it a couple of times, uh, but it was a, a scary experience, I've got to say, with the traffic right beside you on a one metre wide bit of pathway. Uh, pedestrians and cyclists now have seven kilometres of new and separated pathways that encourage active transport, and the works will also allow bus services to increase into the future uh, in line with the growth of the area, including the projected population explosion that's dictated by the state's priority development area in North Shore Hamilton, which is projected to see 15,000 new residents if, uh, when that PDA is completed. Um, there is much more, Mr Chair, that I could say about the great outcomes of this project uh, because it has truly transformed this part of the city, but I also want to acknowledge and pay tribute to those who made it happen. Uh, the Mayor has mentioned these. I'm reminded of this story that was published last week, by, uh, last year, by Michael Madigan, an ode to our tradies who just get it done, uh, which is true. Over, over 5,000 workers, as the Lord Mayor mentioned, worked on this project, and they should take great pride in this project being completed. Uh, I'd like to also thank the former Lord Mayor Graham Quirk and the current Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner for supporting the vision right the way through for Kingston Smith Drive and for committing to its delivery. 
Um, Mr Chair, while there were engineering challenges of building a roadway on the river's edge uh, that did provide some difficulties, uh, I'd like to thank Len Lease, who rose to the challenges. As I mentioned, thousands of workers contributed to the road and they are always proud and they are proud of the achievement and they have certainly left their mark on this city. They always no, remain no, determined no to push on please. and to get the work done. Uh, thank you to the Council's Brisbane Infrastructure Division and particularly to the City Projects Office for their significant role in seeing this project through right from the beginning. Uh, thank you, uh, may I say, to the local community for its patience while we work to transform the corridor. Uh, for any major road upgrade, there will be disruption to those who live and work in the vicinity of the project. Council and Len Lease worked hard to minimise inconvenience as much as possible, and I appreciate the residents in the area were impacted for quite some time. But what has been delivered now in the, is the rebuild of a road, road that's a crucial artery in our city's economy. It links major employment nodes throughout our city and beyond. The airport, the Ports Precinct, the factories of Eagle Farm and Pinkenbar all will benefit from the completion of this uh, project and the investment that we've made. Um, Mr Chair, as the local councillor for Hamilton Ward, it's been a privilege to see the project transform one of, most, of Brisbane's most significant transport corridors um, from start to finish. Uh, it was in my first speech in this place that I said I was committed to making sure that we would see a world-class pedestrian and cyclist connection along KSD. And I'm very pleased to say that we have delivered that in spades and it is now one of the most travelled uh, bits of uh, public of, uh, active transport that we have in the city. Um, this uh, accomplishment marks the realisation of a vision for the precinct which started um, uh, this road back in 1829 when it was a horse and cart trail between Brisbane City and Eagle Farm. Councillor McLaughlin, your time today. has expired. Are there any further questions? Councillor Johnston. Yes, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, tomorrow hundreds of children will be walking to Junction Park State School and have to cross the very busy and dangerous Ipswich Road at Annerley Junction. Has the 50 km an hour speed limit reduction been approved for Ipswich Road Annerley yet? And if not, when is the determination due? The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Johnston. Uh, look, I am not aware of whether there's been an approval for a 50 kilometre an hour speed limit, uh, but I'm certainly happy to take that on notice. I know that there has been a lot of work done by many people in trying to get um, a positive outcome here, uh, and there's been a lot of work done in things like uh, pedestrian movement studies and traffic surveys and a whole range of things, uh, but I will uh, take that one on notice for you. Further questions? Yep. Oh, excuse me, Councillor Atwood. No, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, a recent petition on Council's website was seeking the support of residents for Council's fifth green bridge to the east of the Story Bridge. Can you update the Chamber on what work may have already been done to investigate this idea? The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Atwood, for the question. And uh, I know that uh, this is of interest to quite a few people. Uh, but the uh, idea of a, a Balimba to Tenerife bridge uh, has certainly been kicking around for a little while. Uh, back in 2017, uh, the State Minister for Transport, Mark Bailey, CC'd the then chair, Amanda Cooper, uh, who, as I pointed out, is the next member for ASPLE, uh, in, a response, in a response to a resident inquiry about a potential bridge from Balimba to Tenerife. Uh, so point of order, there was Mr. Point of order going, to you. Uh, Councillor Cook. Uh, could, could you just clarify, was the question about a bridge east of the Story Bridge or specifically the Tenerife to uh, Bulimba Bridge? I, I thought I, it was east of the I, Story Bridge. I believe that was right, uh, but that's a large area that would include that yes. location. Also, we're going through each option. Well, I, I'm not sure. I only heard the question and I'm now listening to the answer. Okay, thank you. So the question's about pedestrian bridge options east of the Story Bridge, the Lord Mayor. That's correct. Uh, and uh, it is interesting because uh, back then there was correspondence between the state government and the then chair, uh, Amanda Cooper, about work that had been done on an exploration study back in 2015. Now, this study was not a council study. <coughs> it was indeed a state government study. Uh, and uh, it says in broad terms, the study indicated that this section of the Brisbane River was too wide and any future bridge must be at a height which would allow uh, for the use of the river by a number of different vessels. Uh, the minister then goes on to state 
and I quote, that there are no current plans to progress the project beyond the initial study. Well, there you go. Uh, Minister Bailey thought it was not feasible uh, to have a bridge in his exploratory study, uh, but unfortunately, no one has ever seen this report in the public. Uh, it is a secret Labor report into a potential bridge uh, in that part of Brisbane. But enter uh, the state election and Councillor Cook, Di Farmer and Grace Grace. We now have uh, a little bit of posturing going on in the community about council, calling on council to investigate a fifth bridge east of the Story Bridge. Now, I don't know whether it is ignorance or whether it is a deliberate attempt to hide the fact that there has already been a study done by the state government. But it is right for residents to ask the question, what happened to that study and why wasn't it released to the public? Because you now have three Labor members asking council to do a study that appears to have already been done by the state government and covered up and made secret. And Councillor Cook, Councillor Cook, please allow the answer to be heard. Lord Mayor. <laughs> Councillor Cook, uh, like Councillor Cassidy, uh, squawks and squeals when they're feeling uncomfortable. And the reality is she is rightly uncomfortable that there is a secret state Labor report that they are covering up and haven't released to the public, yet now they're calling on Council to do another report. So. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest that the first thing that we should do is have a look at that state government secret report oh, okay. to Councillor see Cook, what the findings Councillor of that Cook, were. No, Lord Mayor, please stop. Uh, Councillor Cook, can I please um, uh, ask that you cease interjecting? I think you've made your point through your interjections. The Lord Mayor. Now, Councillor Cook, uh, a simple request to you. If you do have any sway with your Labor colleagues, uh, either at the state level or any other level, please ask them for approval to release that report. And no, don't, no, don't talk about no, Councillor no, no, Murphy here. Councillor Cook, this please. is no, about a no, state Lord Labor. Mayor, please, Lord Mayor, please stop. Councillor Cook. Talk about Councillor a glass Cook. jaw. Talk no, about no, no, a glass jaw. No. All councillors will stop. Councillor Cook. All I'm saying, Councillor Cook, as I say, there's a certain, I do tolerate a certain level of interjections, but you have been somewhat relentless in this answer. I, I, and, you, and your point's been made. Can I please ask you... No. Can I please ask you just to remain silent for the balance of the question? The Lord Mayor. I would simply point out that one of the best things that could help us all going forward in making a decision on uh, future bridges is to start with is having a copy of this state... Labor secret report. Now, we know Councillor Cook, in terms of a record, is not good when it comes to getting her Labor colleagues to do anything, in fact. We know she ran a campaign to try and get the fares removed from the Cross River Ferry. And Minister Bailey said, no thanks, I won't have a, I won't have a bar of that one. Hang on, hang on, stop. Uh, Councillor, no, no, Lord Mayor, everybody stop. All right. Um, Councillor Cook, I consider that you are displaying... Uh, Councillor Cook, I consider that you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with Section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001. I hereby uh, request that you cease interjecting and refrain from exhibiting that conduct. The Lord Mayor. Uh, and as I was pointing out, the efforts to get the fares removed, and, and fares are a state government issue, from the Cross River okay. Ferry... Uh, the, Lord, the Lord Mayor, your, your time has expired. <laughs> Um, Councillor Cook, if you continue to interject at this level, I will move through the um, Section 21 uh, component of the meeting's local law uh, around unsuitable meeting conduct. Are there any further questions? Yes, thank Councillor you. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. 
Lord Mayor, thousands of residents have signed petitions calling for curbside collection to be reinstated. I'm sure you already know this, of course, because you keep a very keen watch on petitions. But your choice to scrap the community service was a very unpopular one. What residents also dislike is the fact that you blame uh, the economic crisis for cutting curbside collections, but continue to spend millions of dollars on promoting yourself. Now, Chair, the Lord Mayor even rubs this in their face by sending out thousands of Living in Brisbane newsletters each and every month. Now, I received my Living in Brisbane newsletter in the mailbox so the very same day I received my rates bill, all bundled up into a little pack together. Now, the only problem, Chair, is this gift isn't one myself or any other resident wanted or needed in a time of crisis. So, Lord Mayor, how are you OK with shamelessly using residents' money to advertise yourself, while at the same time depriving them of vital community services like curbside collection. The Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Cassidy. Well, I can say that there's, uh, there's not too many things that you could teach me, but shameless self-promotion is one of those things. Uh, because I don't send any newsletters out with multiple photos of myself on them, uh, yet we see Councillor Cassidy is a world champion at doing exactly that. Uh, and not only sending out a newsletter with lots of photos of himself in them, but also his mate, Uncle Sterling, or Minister Hinchliffe, uh, in the lead up to a state election, nonetheless. Uh, so, Councillor Cassidy, was this newsletter produced at ratepayer expense? Simple question. It's got a council logo on it. It's got your ward office ratepayer-funded uh, email address, ratepayer-funded office address on it. Uh, it talks about all the great things council's doing in your ward, and there are many great things. Uh, apparently, Councillor Cassidy is responsible for getting 5.6 million in road and congestion funding. What a champion! What a champion! What a cha he he has a similar record to Councillor Shree who has achieved nothing but claims credit for everything, yet attacks anything uh, that the LNP administration does. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Cassidy, um, this is a classic case of a hypocritical question where the premise of the question is simply wrong. Uh, I could learn a few things from you about shameless self-promotion, uh, but uh, what I can say is anything that we send to the ratepayers of Brisbane is important information so that they know what is happening and so that they know how the LNP is responsibly administering their funds that they pay in rates in delivering a better Brisbane. We will continue to do that because it's important that they know. Now, uh, Labor councils would prefer people to be kept in the dark because if they were kept in the dark, they might believe this spin that is put forward by the handful of Labor councillors. They might, in fact, believe that Councillor Cassidy and Labor are responsible for all good things that happen in this city, even though uh, they do not hold administration uh, and even though they oppose most things that happen. Uh, but we will continue to tell people how we're building a better Brisbane. We will continue to tell people Point of order, Chair. about Point of important order. projects. Point of order to you, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, yeah, um, Chair, just on relevance, I know the Lord Mayor has a really um, odd, weird obsession with me, um, but this question was about curbside collection. Uh, was about curbside collection. Okay, all it's right. getting a little weird. No, I have no, to say no, no, no. I mean, all right. Getting some weird so, vibes here, so, Chair. Uh, but if he could, if he could, perhaps answer the question about curbside collection. Um, I will. Uh, I will just. Um, I'll address the, the actual points of your point of order, which is, um, <laughs> Lord Mayor, uh, could you please uh, uh, draw your comments to the uh, to the question at hand, please, the Lord Mayor. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Councillor Cassidy. Um, I can assure you it's nothing personal, but I will continue to call out hypocrisy when I uh, see it. Um, and if you don't want me to keep doing that, don't be so hypocritical. Uh, it's really quite simple. Uh, but as I was pointing out, we will continue to provide uh, ratepayers and residents of Brisbane the important information they need to know on what their council is doing to serve them better, what we are doing to build a better Brisbane. And publications like the Living in Brisbane newsletter is much loved by Brisbane residents, much loved. They appreciate the opportunity to hear what is happening. And guess what? There is no party politics in that newsletter. It's just the facts. It's just information that they need to know. And uh, unlike this sort of 
red material that we see distributed by wards at ratepayer expense. Uh, ours is straight up and down, what's happening, what you need to know. Uh, and it will continue to be the case, while ever I'm Lord Mayor, uh, that we keep people informed about the facts that they need to know about. Now, uh, it is interesting when uh, things happen that they don't like. The first thing that they will say in response is, there hasn't been enough consultation. People don't know about this. People need to know. People need more opportunity to have a say. Yet when we give people lots of opportunities to have a say on things, we give them lots of information. When we provide multiple channels through which they can have their say and provide feedback, apparently, according to Labor, that is self-promotion. Well, no, it's not. It's doing our job and providing the information that people need to have and providing the opportunity to have a say. Uh, so we will continue to do that uh, and we will continue to make sure that uh, our budget is managed responsibly. We will continue to make sure projects are delivered. Infrastructure is built. Uh, building infrastructure is in our DNA. Running responsible budgets is in our DNA. Telling porkies, unfortunately, is in Labor's DNA. And that is a real shame, uh, but unfortunately is not surprising or unexpected. Further questions, point of Councillor, order, point of order, um, Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I just uh, would like to uh, move the suspension of standing orders to enable me to move the following urgency motion, which I've just emailed through Thank uh, you. right now, that the Lord Mayor immediately pause the production and distribution of Brisbane City Council's Living in Brisbane newsletter and reinstate curbside collection. Seconded. I have an urgency motion moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Cook. It should be being distributed by the CCLO service uh, imminently. I think I can see it happening right now. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, um, to, the, to, to the matter of urgency, we will reset your clock right now and you've got three minutes from when the clock resets. Thanks very much, go. Chair. Thanks. This is uh, urgent today because, uh, like residents all around Brisbane, I received my uh, rates bill in the mail and bundled up, as I said, was the Living in Brisbane newsletter. We know from figures that were released uh, by this administration uh, that this newsletter costs uh, ratepayers, doesn't cost the Lord Mayor, doesn't cost us councillors in here, well, it does a little bit out of our rates that we pay, uh, in excess of $100,000 each and every month, Chair. Uh, History tells us that uh, when tough decisions have to be made by this Lord Mayor, as he says, Chair, that the, the only thing that is immune from budget cuts is his self-promotion fund. Uh, is point the of order, point of order Mr. to you, Chair. Deputy Mayor. Relevance to urgency. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Mayor. I remind uh, Councillor Cassidy, please, uh, the three minutes that you have is for the purpose of uh, uh, demonstrating urgency, and can you please limit your, con your comments to those? Councillor Cassidy. Well, thanks very much, Chair. It's urgent because uh, we know that uh, as every week goes by that curbside collection is not available point to people order. and the more that point, they... Point of order to you, Councillor uh, Allen. Mr Chair, just, just to urgency, uh, Councillor Cassidy's just received this newsletter. Um, they're quarterly and uh, I'm just, you know, I don't see urgency in this at all. I, um, I thank you, Councillor Allen. Whether the matter is urgent or not is a matter, a democratic matter for this room that will be voted on in a moment. Uh, Councillor Cassidy has provided this time now to try and make his argument why it should be, why it is urgent. The decision on whether it's urgent will be up to all of us in a moment. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, that's, um, thank you. That's right, Chair. Um, uh, this is urgent because this chamber needs to make this decision because the Lord Mayor, as we know, uh, each and every week that goes by, the so-called tough decisions he has to make usually amount to cutting basic services. They never amount, they never amount uh, to, to um, cutting the advertising budget that he allocates himself. So we must deal with this, Chair. It's urgent that this Chamber deals with this because the Lord Mayor continues to ignore the basic services in our community. He continues to produce these at over $1.2 million each and every year. Uh, the newsletter I put out there, uh, Lord Mayor, uh, costs a couple of thousand dollars. Um, we Councilor, know that this Councilor costs one point two million dollars, and it Councilor is all Cassidy, designed. To to it is urgency, all designed. Please. It is all designed to promote the Lord Mayor. <coughs> In the middle of an economic crisis, we need services that produce jobs, like curbside collection. Uh, we need services uh, okay. that Councilor people Cassidy. demand, like curbside collection. Councillor Cassidy, I appreciate the, the argument you're making. However, it's, it's substantive and not urgent. Uh, can you please... You've been going for about two minutes and 20 seconds. Please, why is this matter urgent? 
Because, well, the mic was off, uh, Lord Mayor, and it's now back on. Thank you very much. Uh, it is urgent to deal with this because the Lord Mayor continues to refuse so. We've heard in response to questions uh, that Councillor Strunk and I have asked, uh, questions about basic services, questions uh, to this Lord Mayor Chair, and he should be accountable to the people of Brisbane and to this chamber, questions about providing the basic services uh, for the rates that he collects. Now, what he is more interested in doing is promoting himself with the rates that he collects than providing basic services to the people of Brisbane. So it is urgent that this council deals with this matter today. Uh, councillors, on the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter to be urgent, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division, Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Please ring the bells. Thank you, councillors. Uh, on the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter is urgent, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those, thank you. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Thank you. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Chairman, you noes have it. The voting being five in favour and 20 against. The noes have it. Thank you, councillors. We will now return to question time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there's quite a bit of time to go, so Councillor Davis, your uh, question, please. Thank you, please. Chair. <coughs> My question is to the Chair of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, can you give the Chamber an update on the Bridgman Downs Neighbourhood Plan, which is currently up for public consultation and covers my ward of McDowell? Uh, the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Davis, for the question. Hopefully I can get through the question without being yelled down from the opposition. Uh, but it's great to see a local councillor quite passionate about her community and the future of her growing <coughs> suburbs. And I know that since becoming a councillor, Councillor Davis, this has been one of your focus in working with the community to create this neighbourhood plan, which is out for public consultation right now. We started with listening to the residents of Bridgman Downs and creating a draft plan to reflect the feedback that we got from them. And it's a clear vision to safeguard the area's future and preserve what residents love best about their growing community. When we launched late last year, we asked residents to tell us what they valued most about about the area and what they think could be improved, how we start every neighbourhood plan. The state government had flagged the area for future development by including it in the urban footprint, and council wanted to ensure that this urban development was in keeping with the residents' desire in the future for their suburb. One of the important themes that emerged was that many of the residents felt that recent housing developments, townhouses and apartments, were not consistent with the green and leafy nature of the area. And the draft strategy proposes to restrict these types of development and only allow for freestanding homes on larger suburban lots. To manage the rate of development, the plan sets clear boundaries for short, medium and long-term housing over a 20-plus year time frame. 
In areas to the east of Beckett and Bridgman Roads, residents can expect to see similar residential housing estates constructed over the next 10 to 20 years. And accompanying each proposal, we want to see detailed site-based planning and environmental assessments that demonstrate how these values will be protected and enhanced. To the west, in the established acreage areas of Bridgman Downs, we don't expect to see much change anytime soon. And there are additional planning controls in place to ensure the protection of the important bushland and waterway corridors. There are two ecologically important freshwater creeks that run through Bridgman Downs. These creeks feed into larger tributaries before the South Pine River to the north. You will see these areas clearly marked on the neighbourhood plan mapping as priority protection areas. This means that although housing may be accommodated outside these corridors, larger lots with vegetated buffers are required. It will also require developers and property owners to undertake restorative planting and even negotiate transferring land back to council ownership. We know urban growth in this area will continue. Council will continue to take action and pull what levers we have available to protect the valued bushland in Bridgman Downs as part of the development of the suburb. As mentioned, the draft strategy is out for consultation until mid-November, and the feedback so far has been really positive. I understand at a Meet the Planner on the weekend, Council Davis, that there was 100 or more that turned up, and the majority were in support of what was actually being proposed in the neighbourhood plan, which I think is a very important reflection of how we have listened and you have made representations to your local area as well. We know that what the people see in Bridge Downs is a relaxed suburb combining city convenience with bushland beauty. Here, natural habitat and waterways are protected and embraced. Well-designed homes contribute to the local community and are connected to natural habitats. Convenient transport connections make getting to surrounding areas easy and active travel options inspire healthy living, clean air, outdoor recreation and smart travel choices. And that's a beautiful vision that the people of Bridgman Downs have put together for this neighbourhood plan and what we have continued with. We will continue to take action and pull what levers we have available to protect the valued bushland in Bridgman Downs as part of the development of the suburb. And as mentioned, the feedback so far has been positive. Over the weekend, as I said, we got the feedback from the community and there are other opportunities for them to have their say and speak with council planners by either booking a virtual talk to the planner session or visiting the next information kiosk, which is on in the next week. We look forward to working with the Bridgman Down residents to create their neighbourhood plan and ensure that Bridgman Downs remains a great place to live into the future. Further, uh, further questions? Councillor Cass uh, Cassidy, yeah. Thanks very much, Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Uh, Lord Mayor, you've always said that ongoing council work should be done by council employees. Yet, week on week, we continue to see contracts brought to this council for jobs as simple and ongoing as footpath construction and repair. This type of work should be council's bread and butter, not outsourced to labour hire companies. And considering we have more than 6,000 streets without any concrete footpath at all, this is a prime example of work that is ongoing. With this in mind, Lord Mayor, why do you continue to deny Brisbane residents solid and permanent jobs at a time when they need income security the most? Lord Mayor. Thank you for the question. Uh, look, the first thing I wanted to clarify is when I have ever made that statement that you suggest I have made. Yes. I'd actually appreciate my memory being jogged here because I don't remember ever saying something like that. Uh, that is not something I can remember ever coming out of my mouth. Uh, but uh, what I do remember is that, once again, we see Labor hypocrisy at work here. We see uh, the political party that outsourced the collection of rubbish to the private sector contractors now claiming that everything should be in source. Now, is there any other example of ongoing core essential service like the collection of rubbish every week. That has got to be the one that touches the most people across the city and happens every single week in every street without fail. Yet Labor outsourced that to the private sector. And now they are suggesting that somehow this is wrong. They did it. And another example is the operation of city cats and ferries. 
City cats and ferries uh, were outsourced by Labor and they continue to be on part of the ongoing work of the city. So this suggestion that they're making, first of all, I don't remember making that statement that uh, was made or that they suggest I made, but secondly, the hypocrisy is breathtaking here. Uh, this is, if you ask me, just another case of um, the unions uh, controlling the Labor Party yes. and the union line uh, coming up again and again in question time. We saw a period where every week the questions were being fed to Labor by the unions. And now, once again, uh, there's this suggestion that somehow uh, Labor wants to insource everything and we support outsourcing. Well, the, the biggest ever outsourcing in the history of this city was done by the Australian Labor Party councillors. The biggest ever outsourcing was done by the Labor Party. Uh, and I would like to know if you support, Councillor Cassie, the collection of waste being done by council rather than by contractor. I'd be interested to know that. I'd be interested to know if you support the operation of ferries and city cats being done by council rather than by a contractor, because that would be the biggest and most monumental change in Labor policy that we have seen in this place. And there have been a lot of changes and a lot of backflips and a lot of moving, uh, moving feasts, but that would be the biggest shift in position. So if that is now indeed your position, uh, I'd be very interested to know. Uh, but I do remember when this issue about footpaths came up recently, uh, there was a, a, uh, a figure of something like up to $20 million over, I think, seven years or something. Uh, that was the potential length of the uh, contract. Now, this year, we're investing... Uh, we're investing... Oh, it was eight years, was it? Nine years! OK, so $20 million over nine years that was potentially being done in partnership with the private sector. Yet this year, we're investing around $40 million into things like footpaths. So you can see the quantum of what we do in-house versus what we do uh, in partnership with the private sector when it comes to footpaths. Uh, but I just have to again return to this hypocrisy in the question. Uh, Councillor Cassidy uh, just either do isn't aware of his own party's history in this place or is just uh, trying to gloss over that uh, and pretend that he believes something that he doesn't believe? I don't know. Uh, but uh, we know that Labor supports outsourcing. Their record shows it. Uh, we believe that uh, each case should be judged on its merits. There are some situations that are better done in-house, and there are others which are better done in partnership with the private sector. Uh, and we make a judgment on a case-by-case -case basis and we don't have a philosophical view one way or the other. I'll give you an example. We had the option, uh, if we wished, to propose Brisbane Metro should be operated by private sector operators, i.e. not by Transport for Brisbane, but by the private sector. And what did we do? We recommended that it should be operated by Transport for Brisbane by our council bus operators. And so, our record shows, once again, that we make this judgment on a case-by-case -case basis in the best interest of the city, in the best interest of the ratepayers of Brisbane, uh, and we will continue to go so, uh, do so going forward. So there's not, not an ideological bent here one way or the other. It's, it's practical and it's, best, it's based on a case-by-case -case basis. Further questions? Uh, Councillor Adaman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is to the Chair of the Finance and Administration Committee. Councillor Allen, Council has recently run a number of advertisements promoting local businesses across the suburbs of Brisbane. Can you outline for the Chamber how this has been promoting by local and helping them recover from a COVID downturn? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, and uh, thank you, Councillor Adaman, for the question. Uh, it's pleasing to note your interest in the welfare of businesses, and particularly local businesses, during these challenging times. And having grown up in the Pullen Vale ward, I'm well aware of the, uh, the diversity of the businesses in that ward and also the very strong local business precincts you have. And uh, a lot of those have very long-term proprietors and it's a uh, tight-knit business community. Um, Mr Chair, uh, the Briz Better Local uh, campaign is a localised promotional campaign to drive economic recovery by promoting suburban businesses and shopping precincts and encouraging residents to get out and about 
buy local and discover more things to see and do close to home. We are not blind in the devastating economic impact of COVID-19 and the impact it continues to have on residents and businesses alike. This particular initiative was one of the initiatives from the Economic Recovery Task Force and is part of the Economic Recovery Plan, which I tabled in this chamber during the last session. The $550,000 campaign will profile hundreds of local businesses and is all about encouraging residents to explore their own backyard, support local businesses, local jobs and drive local economic activity. It's about injecting new life into our local shopping precincts. These 70 localised social media, media videos are produced in Brisbane for Brisbane and are a great benefit to residents and businesses alike. The vast majority of the work undertaken to produce these videos is undertaken by council staff and I think to date they have done a terrific job. I truly believe Brisbane is the best place to live and Brisbane Local is all about highlighting all there is to see and do in our suburbs. To date, we have produced 11 videos that feature businesses across the city from multiple wards, including The Gap, Forest Lake, McGregor, Deegan, Wynnum Manley, Tennyson, to name a few, and there will be more to come. All of these videos are currently available on the Council website. Mr Chair, you don't need to leave Brisbane to have a good time or create great memories. Some of the best experiences are right here in our own backyards. And this campaign is all about reminding residents to back Brisbane during these tough times. I cannot stress enough that this will be a much needed economic boost to local businesses. It's vital we all do our bit and get behind our local businesses right now. And this is particularly important as we lead into the Christmas period where there's a great opportunity to support our local businesses. It not only keeps these businesses with their doors open, but it supports local jobs and creates a great sense of local community. Whether it's grabbing a cup of coffee, purchasing a gift for someone or a voucher, or enjoying a meal with family, it's never a better time to get out and support our local businesses. It would also be remiss of me not to say that this is a great way of making the Brisbane of today even better than the Brisbane of tomorrow. For those listening in today and for councillors here, please visit Council's website and search Brisbetter Local. These uh, videos are there. There's 11 of them, as I mentioned. They're spread right across the city, and it really gives you an ability to see what the city's got to offer. Um, the videos feature a diverse range of local businesses. Um, what I would say to all councillors, and uh, I think that at this point in time, we need to get behind the city. Uh, we need to get behind the city's businesses. Those videos are a great way to promote your local businesses. So when you see them come up, share them on your social media, really support them, get out there and say to your businesses, we're here to support you. If you've got businesses in your area who you think might like to be profiled on these videos, there's an opportunity to make some recommendations. Clearly we can't get all of them up, but certainly we want to try and provide a real mix of uh, the businesses that are out there and we want them to feature in these videos. So to the whole of the chamber, please get behind these. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes question time. Uh, councillors, I uh, draw to your attention the consideration of committee reports, please. The Establishment and Coordination Committee, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 19th of October, be adop adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. The report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 19th of October, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to start off by uh, acknowledging that tomorrow uh, marks the fourth anniversary of the death of Manmeet Sharma, um, one of our much-loved bus operators and someone who uh, has now become a, whole, a household name across Brisbane and someone who literally caused everyone in Brisbane on that day uh, to pause in horror. Uh, at what had happened here in our city. 
someone who was much loved by their colleagues, someone who was just doing their job, and someone who was brutally and tragically murdered while doing their job. I just want to, at this time, um, say that our thoughts, and, I, and I, I'm sure I speak on behalf of all councillors and all council staff, our thoughts are with uh, Manmeet's family, uh, his friends, and indeed all council bus operators as we approach the fourth anniversary uh, of this tragedy. Down in uh, uh, Luxworth Place, known as Manmeet's Paradise and Park, uh, there is a permanent memorial uh, to Manmeet and um, acknowledging, uh, I guess, the absolute tragedy that happened here and uh, I guess reminding the community on the importance of, first of all, the work that our council staff do, whether they're bus operators or uh, in our libraries or in a, in a range of other public facing roles. Uh, and also the um, unexpected nature of um, just an inconceivable threat like this that can come out of the blue. Um, I, I will never forget that day uh, because on that day I was the chair of the Public and Active Transport Committee. On that day I was responsible for our bus network and our public transport and felt responsible for all of our bus operators. And on that day I will never forget the shock and horror that I felt as the events unfolded to hear the news of what had happened and then to progressively learn more and more about that tragic attack. I will never forget that uh, the person who committed this horrific crime uh, was walking along the street and at one point following a woman and a young child with the potential for the same thing to happen to that woman and young child. And so it wasn't Manmeet's fault that he was there at that time, at that day, providing a service. Uh, but it is a reminder to all of us on uh, just how precious life is, on how we should cherish each other, and on how we should continue to support that culture that Brisbane has where we do simple things like um, when we get off the bus, we thank the driver. Uh, not all cities do that doesn't happen everywhere. There are plenty of cities where people walk around looking at the ground, not making eye contact with each other. Uh, there are plenty of cities uh, where they don't show the level of kindness and respect uh, to people like bus operators. And it is something that we must always remember and retain. Uh, it's those simple kindnesses that uh, go a long way. And it is also a time when we should reflect that it is still uh, not okay that a small number of people in our community continue to perpetuate abuse and violence towards bus operators and other public officials doing their job. Um, and so I won't go into any of the politics of this, obviously, but simply to say tomorrow is an opportunity for us to all think about uh, what we can do as a community to say no to this kind of violence, this kind of abuse and this kind of threat uh, to people that are just doing their job and recommit ourselves to a kinder society and one that says thank you, driver, uh, and one that values the work that um, our staff and public officials do uh, in providing those great services. <clears throat> I, uh, in, uh, in my normal introduction to the NC report, <clears throat> I just wanted to um, uh, refer to a number of uh, events and, uh, I guess, community causes that we normally do to uh, acknowledge through the lighting up of council assets. Uh, and the month of October marks Sexual Violence Awareness Month in Queensland. Uh, Zigzag Young Women's Resource Centre works with young women aged from 12 to 25 years around issues of sexual violence and homelessness, as well as working with the community to raise awareness. Uh, the Tropical Dome at Mount Cutha, uh, Brisbane City Hall, the Victoria Bridge and Story Bridges uh, will light up in teal this evening in support uh, of the work that is done by Zigzag and so many other people and so many other groups uh, to say no to sexual violence. Uh, on Wednesday, so tomorrow, the Redcliffe Place sculptures and the Victoria 
uh, bridge and story bridges will be lit up in red uh, to support uh, the red bag appeal. The red bag appeal is the Wesley Mission's uh, annual appeal, uh, which is all about the community coming together to give dignity, respect, uh, and show the spirit of Christmas to those individuals and families that are doing it tough. And we know that this year will be a more challenging year uh, than most for many families. Uh, and so uh, we're keen to, as we always do, support the Wesley Mission in their red bag appeal. Uh, Thursday marks the eve of World Teachers Day. Uh, and um, the Queensland Te College of Teachers promotes the teaching profession and the importance of teachers in our children's lives. Uh, there, um, there are a few professions uh, that have such an impact in the life of a child than our teachers. Uh, they do a fantastic job. Uh, and I know we, we know many inspirational teachers. Uh, my sister is a teacher and I'm proud of the work that she does. Uh, and in moving around the community and moving around my local area, um, there's not too many times where I don't bump into someone and they say, your sister taught me uh, when I was in grade five or in grade four, and she was amazing and she changed my life. Um, and that story is repeated with so many teachers across the city. It's a, a truly admirable profession. It is a profession that makes a real difference. Um, and obviously we all join together in supporting World Teachers Day. Uh, the Story Bridge, Victoria Bridges and Radcliffe Place sculptures will be lit in green on Thursday in support of World Teachers Day. I uh, wanted to mention a couple of uh, good news stories. Um, and uh, first of all, I wanted to point out that just recently, uh, Council and also um, our conference organiser, Carillion Conference Management, uh, won the award for the best congress or conference at the 2020 Australian Event Awards. Uh, so this is the uh, annual awards for conventions and events across Australia, and the winner was the 2019 Asia Pacific City Summit and Mayors Forum. Uh, so that picked up the uh, award for best congress or, or conference uh, in the 2020 Australian Event Awards. Uh, the summit was nominated uh, by uh, the, the organiser, Carillion Conference Management, who did a fantastic job, uh, and Ashley and the team uh, are just amazing. Uh, this is an event that uh, was so complicated, it involved so many visitors and official delegations from all around the Asia Pacific region and all around the world. Uh, and the event ran incredibly smoothly. Uh, the event uh, further strengthened the relationships that we have at the city level between t so many cities, so many councils, so many mayors and deputy mayors right across the region. Uh, and it was great that uh, this summit was acknowledged in that way. I want to particularly thank not only the conference organisers, Carillion, but our team here in council, uh, who literally uh, worked day and night on this. Um, just the blood, sweat and tears that went into this event uh, was incredible. Uh, I uh, will never forget the frantic pace of that event. Um, I think I'd lost my voice a couple of times. Um, but uh, I just want to thank everyone who was involved in putting that together. And I know the Deputy Mayor is particularly proud of the team as well uh, for that event. Also, uh, warmest congratulations to Council's City Archivist, Annabel Lloyd, on being recently awarded a 2020 President's Award from the Australian Society of Archivists. There is a, such a society, uh, and it is a very serious society. Um, because they deal with some very serious uh, business. Um, the archiving of public records and council records uh, is really important. It's an important thing and one that we treat very seriously, uh, not only uh, when it comes to uh, making sure that we have access to the records to make decisions or that the public has access to the records for transparency reasons, but that there is a historical record of what has happened in our city and when. Lord uh, Mahan, your time has expired. Move for an extension. <coughs> Seconded. It's been uh, an extension of time has been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hutton. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. Oh, thank you. Uh, Guys, have it, Lord Mayor, 10 minutes. A, a, uh, is, oh, sorry. Uh, as I was saying, uh, it is so important that there's a historical record of the growth and development uh, of our city and uh, the decisions that were made by our council 
uh, and it is just a fascinating but important job. <clears throat> uh, Annabelle uh, has said that she has found her involvement with the association to be rewarding and stimulating, uh, providing understanding of the wider context of her profession and the key policies that underpin archival work. Uh, she has met colleagues from across Australia and the world uh, and she believes that being part of the organisation provides much needed professional development and support to an archivist working in isolation from other archivists. And that is also an important point as well. Uh, we don't have a lot of archivists in Brisbane City Council. It's quite a, in some ways, a lonely job. Um, you're there in a, a big building with a lot of documents and not too many other people. Uh, so it takes a certain type of person <laughs> Uh, but um, her involvement with other archivists across Australia uh, is uh, very important. Annabelle's contribution to the ASA has also been significant <clears throat> over many years. She's been a convener, council member and secretary, and her involvement has just extended to conference committees, training and standards development. Uh, in recent years, she's been a member of the Professional Accreditation Committee, supporting members who wish to obtain professional recognition by the society. Anyone who knows Annabelle will also understand her passionate commitment to her profession and to her role. Uh, Council City Archives certainly benefits from that passion, extensive knowledge and expertise. And it's great to see this professional acknowledgement uh, for Annabelle uh, and also her wider profession. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, item that we have in front of us, uh, and there's uh, one item on the agenda at the moment, is for the surrender of parkland at 15B Butterfield Street, uh, Hurston. Uh, this item relates to the surrender of land associated with the Queensland Government's Ernie's Roundabout bus layover and driver facility. Uh, so this is effectively uh, uh, right near the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital station, uh, a little bit to the north of that. Um, and it is a uh, much needed and important layover area uh, for our bus fleet and other bus companies as well, uh, and also a rest area for drivers as well. The Department of Transport and Main Roads is now planning uh, to construct an additional and new bus layover at 35 Butterfield Street, Hurston, uh, which is near uh, the existing bus layover. Uh, but in between those two sites is a section of uh, council land. Uh, well, it's land that's owned by the state but held in trust by council, which is the case for uh, a lot of land across the city. The land uh, located at 15B Butterfield Street is 753 square metres and is currently managed by council for parks and gardens purposes. Uh, for TMR to carry out their works to deliver this busway connection, Council will need to surrender the trusteeship of the land. Our council's transport planning and operations within Brisbane infrastructure uh, have supported this uh, because of the public transport benefits that it will bring. And obviously, uh, this layover area will also be of benefit to the Brisbane Metro. Uh, and as we gear up services um, and provide those new, larger and longer fully electric vehicles, uh, this will be a benefit to Metro as well as to the uh, wider transport network. Uh, so uh, it is a matter of having land that is currently designated for one purpose, uh, transferred to be de designated for another purpose. There is a good community benefit in this. There is a good public transport benefit um, and it is something that we do support. Further speakers, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Um, uh, in the ENC report, uh, today there's a um, item giving um, state government land back for a um, worthwhile purpose and Labor councillors are supportive of that. But um, I think what is interesting is how threadbare this ENC report is. Uh, we're in the middle of a um, global pandemic and a recession uh, and we're having, you know, throughout question time and uh, uh, online, oh, I try and have a debate with uh, a councillor Schrinner online but he's blocked me um, on all those platforms. But there are a lot of things to debate, uh, Chair, at the moment uh, in our city, the type of city we want to have, the type of city we want to leave for future generations. But when you see the documents that this administration brings to Council to debate, these are the decisions of the highest decision-making body outside of this chamber in terms of the administration of this city, it's pretty threadbare. 
Um, why aren't we discussing items like this Lord Mayor's uh, double barrel rates hike chair? Uh, we know that he's going to increase rates on the 1st of January um, and he's going to uh, increase Councillor, rates Councillor Cassidy, again on the 1st no, no, of July. Please allow me to speak. Um, I understand the point that you're making an argument, but um, I will allow comments about the, um, the report generally, but to draw in items that are clearly not in the report because you wish to speak about them is outside the rules. Councillor Cassidy. But that's exactly the point, Chair. There is nothing of substance for this council to debate when it comes to the decisions that are being made by this Lord Mayor and his civic cabinet. What about curbside collection, Chair? Uh, what about this Lord Mayor's refusal uh, to reinstate curbside collection for well, people? Well, we on. have this, thousands this was, of people signing... This is the point I was making. I mean, y you can talk about the nature of the report. We, we have allowed that in the past. Sometimes these are quite substantial and have had 15, 17 items and we've allowed debate about the size of the report. But again, you just can't... The, the rules don't allow for you just to choose any issue and just talk about it. That, that's the limiting nature of the rules. And, and that's what this Lord Mayor is doing, Chair. He is, he is limiting the work that this council is doing in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a recession, where we should be talking about things like contracting out, for instance, and having the debate about the type of council and the type of jobs we want to have here in Brisbane, Chair. That's what should be in this ENC, instead of the Lord Mayor throwing away glib political lines uh, in, in, instead of answering genuine questions in question time, why don't we have this debate in ENC? Uh, we don't know whether the, these people in ENC are uh, discussing these items or not. Point of order, Mr. Point Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor. Twice Adams. you've directed it again, relevance to the report before us. There's nothing yeah. in it. Look at no, it. No, no, no. That's it. Okay. That's all on. the business no, of Councillor, Civic Cabinet. Councillor Cassidy, I'm obligated to address all points of order that are made. Um, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Um, Councillor Cassidy, can I please draw you back to the report? As I've said, making general comments about the report in front of us is always allowed, but pulling in items that are not here is not allowed. Councillor Cassidy. Well, somebody needs to talk about them, Chair, because this Lord Mayor and this administration simply won't. They won't address the issues uh, that our city will be facing as we emerge uh, from uh, the COVID-19 health pandemic uh, into the COVID-19 recession. Uh, we need to know what the plan is going forward as to how to deal with these double barrel <laughs> rates increases. No, no. Uh, see, and no, and no, insecure work. No, this Lord Cassidy, Mayor is locking I'm stop you these... All right. Section 35.7, during the debate... No, I'm speaking. 35.7, during the debate on the motion, the Chairman may rule out of order any aspects of the, of the debate which do not relate to the specified subject matter under debate and may direct that the issue may be raised during general business. Um, Councillor Cassidy, I've asked many times for you to... Uh, I've, I've permitted general discussion, but you are expanding my leniency beyond what I believe to be acceptable, so can I please bring you back to the report? Councillor Cassidy. Well, thanks, Chair. And again, this report is so threadbare um, that other items really do need to be discussed by this council. It shouldn't just be up to individual councillors making general business speeches about this. This is about the way in which our city is being governed and the future that we are leaving for residents of this city. Uh, on, a, on another point, uh, Chair, that we should be discussing, the Lord Mayor did mention it uh, in his opening remarks, uh, was another piece of land on the other side of the city uh, at Balmoral High. Now, uh, we had an opportunity to discuss that last okay. week. Look, look. I appreciate trying to build an argument, but you, if I allow this, then um, it would be a new ruling that would be beyond... Uh, it would set a new precedent that we would not... Uh, that's not acceptable in this place. So can I please ask you to come back to the topic at hand? Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes. Uh, would the Leader of the Opposition take a question? No questions. Councillor Cassidy. What? 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 We've been over this. No. No, no, no. There will be no How use... How do you know until you hear the question? I can. I can, I can refuse a question to be asked. It's within the rules. What? Councillor Cassidy. I move dissent in your ruling. Seconded. Dissent in my ruling. Moved by Councillor Johnson, seconded by Councillor Shree. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Shree. Please ring the bells. Can you...
councillors, on the matter of uh, dissent, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Uh, clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. Uh, thank you. The noes have it. Councillors, I draw your attention to section 4111A, which allows the chairman to refuse permission for general questions to be asked. Councillor Cassidy. Well, thank you very much, Chair. They can give it, but they can't take it in this place. Uh, the Lord Mayor very clearly referred to that matter, and that is a matter that is exactly the same as is contained in this report. There is a request for Council to surrender the trust of a piece of land back to the state government for their purposes. And that's what we were attempting to debate last week, and that's what we know uh, is the exact case on the other side of the city chair, and the Lord Mayor referred to that. A very simple request, why they won't deal with issues like that, but uh, in this instance we're able to deal with it uh, in a very, very simple way. And that's exactly what we would have been able to do had the Lord Mayor uh, taken that item through ENC and brought it to this council chamber. Uh, so the point uh, I'm trying to make, Chair, and I'm uh, sure uh, everyone realises what it is, is that the work that this administration is carrying out, um, particularly at the moment, as we are about to enter one of the worst recessions this country has ever seen, we have a plethora of issues that need to be dealt with by this administration, and all we're getting is a two-page threadbare document, uh, which is a pretty standard business-as-usual thing. Now, that needs to happen, of course, we can deal with that. But this approach by this administration as a business as usual approach in the middle of the worst health pandemic and economic crisis we have ever seen is actually very pathetic. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Johnston. Well, I'll say a few words, seeing uh, on, on the only item in the report before us today. Um, simply because, at this point, my question to the uh, Leader of the Opposition was um, brutally um, uh, smacked down by the Chairman. Um, it's not often that that happens. I've been here 12 years. I think that's the second time in 12 years it's been done, and both times to me and both times by the current Chairman, from memory. Um, there is only one item on the ENC agenda today. That's item A, and that relates to the uh, surrender of land for the Queensland State Government. Um, for this one item, I believe the Lord Mayor has paid an extra $100,000 for his efforts this year, um, and the chairmen of the committees, 20 something, so between them at least another $100,000. And I'd just like to put on the record to the residents of Brisbane um, that there are all these other issues um, that we would like to speak about in this chamber. Um, but because the Lord Mayor, who's paid an extra $100,000 a year, sets the agenda, he's only put one item on the agenda. That's the surrender of parkland in Hurston. As a result of his complete and utter control of the agenda, we're not allowed to speak on anything else. For this privilege, he's paid an extra $100,000 a year, and the ENC committee, all of whom sat in deliberation of this item behind closed doors and agreed with his decision to only put one item on the council agenda today, are also paid. Point of order, point, Mr. Chair. Point of order. I believe uh, the councillor is imputing motive. Um, I'm not sure if I agree with the, the sentiment that she's imputing motive, but. Um, I, th I think that, that uh, in this instance, um, while the council is being impolite, she's not breaking the rules. Councillor Johnston. I'm sorry. Is it impolite the Lord Mayor is being paid $100,000 a year to consider one item and not do any work on behalf of the city and then attempt to restrict debate in this place? That's what's impolite. Point of Telling order. me point I'm of impolite. Point, point of order to you, Councillor Adams. Comments are incorrect, therefore imputing motive. Um, no, no. OK. Councillors, as I say, th this item in front of us is about the surrender of land uh, for the purpose of, of allowing uh, improved bus layover facilities in Hurston. Um, that is what we're talking about. I, I allow, I've allowed the Leader of the Opposition some 
capacity to talk about the nature of the document. Um, I would ask councillors to uh, keep their uh, comments courteous and, to limit, and to, to limit their comments to those that are reflected within the rules. Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it's, it does worry me to some extent that the Deputy Mayor doesn't understand the difference between facts and uh, imputing motive, and that is a bit of a worry. Um, but I'd just make the point, and wrapping up, um, that it's not good enough that the Lord Mayor sets yeah. the agenda in this place, restricts, um, which restricts the ability to speak on matters. For this privilege, um, he, Councillor Adams, and all of the chairs are paid hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in additional salary. Meanwhile, um, whilst the issue of the uh, surrender of parkland at Hurston, um, I'm sure, took all of about two minutes for them to, uh, to process, there are huge issues in this city that they are refusing to allow us to discuss because of the way in which they control the agenda. Further speakers? Yeah. Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Just rise to speak on the item on the report and place on the record my concerns about um, converting this public green space into other uses. Obviously, I can see the need for the public transport facility and, and bus layer of services, but as a general principle, I think we need to treat inner city public green space as something of a priority. And if land is needed for public transport infrastructure or active transport infrastructure or other community facilities, then that land should be acquired um, from other sites as opposed to simply converting more and more inner city green space. We're seeing a general trend across the inner city. We've seen this with Victoria Park in particular, but with quite a lot of other public green spaces where whenever we need land for some other project or the state government needs land for some other project, um, inevitably parkland is the cheapest, cheapest and easiest way to find that land. And so parkland is gradually converted bit by bit towards other uses. That's a consistent trend in this city across many years, but it's something that we need to start drawing a line on. And if the state government really needs extra space for X or Y purpose, then they need to be offsetting any loss of public green space through the creation of new public green space. Um, particularly in this side, I think it's important to maintain a, a solid buffer to that creek corridor. But just as a general principle, and I think the local councillors who re represent this part of the city should be a little bit more vocal about this because I think they've perhaps not been um, advocating strongly enough around this idea that if we are to lose public green space for any kind of facility or service in the inner city, there needs to be a net increase in public green space nearby to offset that. The continual erosion and piecemeal um, removal of public parkland is not something that I support and I think there's a better balance to be struck where we say, okay, if you need space for a bus layover or whatever it is, buy, land, buy private land off a neighbouring site. In this case, it's not a large block of land. We're talking about a couple of hundred square metres. Um, so it's, it, it's not something that I think we, we need to make a big fuss about. But I think it, as a general principle, we, we should be very cautious about just turning over public green space to other uses because it, it it has unfortunately become the habit of this administration just to continue doing that whenever we need land for any other purpose. Um, and I don't think it's something that residents are particularly happy about because time and again, we hear about the loss of public green space. We hear residents complaining that there's not enough green space in the inner city. And a big part of that problem is what little green space we do have is gradually getting converted to other uses, whether that's road infrastructure, public transport infrastructure, what have you. So. Um, I won't be supporting that particular item. I'll leave my comments at that. Further speakers? There being none, the Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I can confirm a couple of important bits of information um, that are really relevant when you've heard the contribution today. First of all, uh, we will never judge the outcomes of this council uh, by the number of paper submissions that come through to Council each week. That will never be a true test of the impact of what we do and the positive benefits that we deliver. And if Labor's measure of the work that we do is uh, the amount of paper that comes through to Council each week, um, then it really shows that they've got the wrong priorities. Uh, our measure of the benefit for ratepayers is projects like KSD, which are city-changing 
projects delivered under budget which then deliver a savings to ratepayers. Projects like the Brisbane Metro, projects like Victoria Park, projects like new double-decker city cats, projects like the $500 million of road upgrades right across the suburbs, po projects like the record investment in parks and green space, projects like saving bushland, which this administration and this side of politics has championed for the last 30 years. They're the sort of things that make a difference to ratepayers and the residents of Brisbane, not the amount of paperwork that comes through to a council meeting. Councillor Cassidy must be in some incredible political bubble if he thinks that that is the true test of the work of an administration. Councillors, please allow the Lord Mayor to be heard in silence. Lord Mayor. But we know he is in a bubble. It's a bubble that effectively involves um, him thinking that Twitter is real life, him thinking that uh, his trolling and efforts on social media are real life. Real life is the 70,000 motorists a day and the thousands and thousands of uh, pedestrians and cyclists that will benefit from the KSD upgrade, the upgrade which Labor opposed, the upgrade which Labor repeatedly told fibs about, the upgrade which Labor again and again says was $100 million over budget, their words, yet today has come in under budget by $15 million. Uh, and Councillor Cassidy, Councillor Cassidy talks about what we're doing in a time of crisis. Well, I can tell you, he obviously hasn't been listening at all because when it goes beyond his prepared script and his questions and his political lines, uh, he seems to have no interest in what actually happens in this place. Uh, but what I confirmed earlier today is that this financial year, for the first time in living memory, we will see the average residential rates bill go down not just be frozen, but to go down. I asked our finance team uh, to uh, tell me when the last time that this happened was. And they've been searching the archives, um, thanks to our archivist. <laughs> and guess what? Couldn't find another year where average residential rates in Brisbane went down. Not one year. No, no, not one no. year. No interjections, please. Lord Mayor. Not one year in the records that they have available to them could they find another year where average residential rates went backwards. No, no, no interjections, please. Lord Point Mayor. of order, Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will the Lord Mayor take a question? Lord Mayor, will you take a question? No. Uh, no, he's declined. And Lord so, uh, to confirm once again... Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, yes, um, I just uh, asked Mr. Chairman um, why Councillor Shri is allowed to ask a question, but you've refused to allow me to ask a question. Uh, your question earlier was clearly uh, a cynical attempt to get around my earlier direction to Councillor Cassidy, <laughs> Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Point of order, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Point of order, uh, As Councillor Johnston. As I didn't actually get to ask a question, oh. no. Um, no, I, no, I know what no, point no, of order it's is. not. It's I not am, funny. No, no, it demonstrates no. bias. I, I am well experienced, experience, Mr. Chair. well experienced with you, <laughs> Councillor Johnston. No, 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 no. Yes, you are. You are. And I will be taking your Councillor Johnston, you are displaying uh, unsuitable uh, meeting conduct. And in, a con and in accordance with section 215 of the meeting's local law, I hereby request that you apologise for your comments. You need to apologise for being biased and abusing me. Councillor Johnston, Mr. as you have failed to comply with the request to take remedial action for your unsuitable meeting conduct, I hereby warn you in accordance with section 21.7 of the meeting's local law that failing to comply with, my, uh, with the request may result in an order being issued against you. The Lord Mayor. Uh, point of order. The Lord Mayor. I would ask uh, Councillor Johnson to p please withdraw those comments. Uh, the suggestion that you are biased or abusive uh, is just outrageous, uh, and I would call on Councillor Johnson to please withdraw. Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Johnson, I call on you to withdraw your comments that I am biased and abusive because they are You were so clearly biased and abusive towards me in your commentary outside of the rules of procedure in a inappropriate way and I will not accept it.
Um, Councillor Johnston, as you continue to fail to comply with the request to take remedial action for your unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with section 21.9 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby make an order reprimanding you for your conduct. Your conduct and this reprimand will be noted in the minutes of this meeting. The Lord Mayor. Uh, point of order, I move dissent in your ruling. Seconded. Uh, there's dissent in my ruling uh, by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Griffiths. All those in favour say aye. 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 And those against say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston. Seconded. And Councillor Griffiths, please ring the bells. Thank you, councillors. All those who, uh, in the, who are in the affirmative for the dissent of my ruling, please say aye and raise your a hand. Aye. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the uh, noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 19 against. The noes have it. Uh, councillors also, in future, um, it will not be tolerated. Uh, threats of legal action against me will not be tolerated in the future, Lord Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I move on to talking about the issues uh, that I was raising before, I did want to address this current issue uh, at the moment. Uh, while it is true that you are a member of the LNP, uh, as Chair always is a member of a political party through successive administrations. Your job is to apply the rules fairly, and I have seen uh, week after week you do that. So much so that if I step out of line, you will not hesitate to bring me back in. Uh, so much so uh, that members of our team will be reprimanded or brought back into line. Happens week after week, again and again. But that point aside, uh, the suggestion that you are abusive, I find incredibly offensive. And it actually... It, it, it really takes away weight from what is a very serious claim. Uh, we live in a society where there is ever-increasing concerns about abusive behaviour and bullying uh, and threatening and violence. And Councillor Councillor Johnston, no, you, no, Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston. Um, Please, I direct you to cease interjection, uh, interjecting. Councillor Johnston, I consider that you're displaying uh, unsuitable meeting conduct and in accordance with section 21.5 of the Meetings Local Law 2001, I hereby request that you cease interjecting and refrain from that, con that conduct. The Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, it is very easy for people to uh, throw around claims of abusive behaviour or bullying uh, and I have seen you week after week, just in the same way that you apply the rules fairly, uh, deal in a very gracious and patient way uh, with sometimes in incredibly challenging and frustrating situations. And I also know you personally, and you are the last person to be abusive. You're a teddy bear. Um, I know that, uh, and you've approached this role uh, with professionalism, uh, and I thank you for that, and I really do believe it's been inappropriate today uh, what Councillor Johnson has claimed. But moving back uh, to this uh, discussion on what this administration is doing in a time of crisis, in a time of economic challenge. Uh, and I was pointing out that this administration has delivered the very first reduction in rate bills for the average residential property that we have seen in the city's history. Uh, and our corporate finance team have not been able to find another financial year where this has happened, yet it will happen this year. And it will only happen through responsible financial management, uh, and that will mean uh, that the average residential rate bill across all residential properties will go from $1,668.17 last financial year down to $1,659.90 this financial year. And so 
Not only are we building the infrastructure our city needs, we're also keeping rates down, and literally down, because the way that the current COVID rebate works, now as you're aware, there's a special rebate um, for the first two quarters. Uh, what that does is that prevents uh, the accounts going up, so the rate bill's going up, so it, it level pegs them with what uh, they would have paid last year, but for many residential properties, they're actually going backwards. And so while it prevents an increase, it doesn't prevent people going down. So the overall movement as a result of the COVID rebate and also now the KSD special rebate uh, that we'll be bringing in for the next quarter is that the average residential rate bill is going down. Now, Labor can make all types of outrageous claims, but the facts will speak for themselves. The impacts uh, and the evidence will speak for itself. Uh, that we support ratepayers in a time of need, but we also build the infrastructure our city needs, and we don't shy away from those big complex projects. And so what can this council do to support Brisbane in a time of need? We can keep rates down and we can build infrastructure and support local jobs and the local economy. And they are the things we are absolutely focused on. They are the things that we will remain focused on. And I don't care how many paper reports come through to this council. The important thing is the impact out on the ground. The important thing are the results out on the ground, building a better Brisbane, and that's what we will continue to do. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move the suspension of standing orders to allow me to move the following urgency motion. The Brisbane City Council condemn the decision of the Lord Mayor, Adrian Schrinner, and the LNP administration to decommission the Norman Park Ferry Terminal and cancel all Norman Park Cross River Ferry services. Further, the Brisbane City Council commit to repair and upgrade of the Norman Park Ferry Terminal and reinstatement of Norman Park Ferry Services. Seconded. I trust you've got that in writing for the distribution? Thank you. It's been sent to you now. All right. It's been uh, sent around. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Cook, seconded by Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Councillor Cook, you have three minutes to establish urgency. Please limit your comments to the matters of urgency. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, late on Friday afternoon, the day before the AFL Grand Final in Brisbane, before anyone had the courtesy to tell me as the local councillor, let alone consult me, this LNP administration dropped letters to my residents, well, to be fair, some of my residents, not all residents in my area who were actually impacted by this callous decision, telling them, not consulting them, telling them that the Norman Park Ferry would close for good and public transport in their local area would be cut because Mayor Adrian Schrinner and the LNP had let the terminal deteriorate and that patronage was not where it needed to be. This is urgent because this is the first opportunity since that decision was made, with no consultation, uh, for this LNP administration to be held accountable for this appalling decision. This is urgent because over 600 residents have now signed the petition for reinstatement of these services. This is also urgent because I know that since Friday, my residents have personally written to the Mayor, hundreds have expressed despair and disappointment online and shared their own experiences of how these cuts to critical public transport infrastructure will impact their lives. Mr Chair, Candy has written to the Lord Mayor and said... Uh, Councillor, uh, Councillor Cook, um, I appreciate the point you're making, but I believe that they are probably more likely to be of a substantive rather, nature rather than urgent and procedural nature. Can I please ask you to, uh, can I please ask you to draw your comments back to the matter of this urgency? This is urgent because Candy says Norman Park residents are being treated as second-class citizens, an absolute disgrace. This is urgent because Renee says my commute to work has been severely impacted by adding an extra 40 minutes to my commute time. This is urgent because Claire says it's utterly disgusting, disappointing and downright stupid to remove public transport as the city grows. It's a community service, public transport and not something that must always generate income. It's urgent because Daniel says, Adrian, isn't your job as mayor meant to focus on the Brisbane community and protecting their rights and wellbeing? He goes on, why wasn't there a discussion with the impacted community about ways to make it work? Maybe shorter hours, less frequent crossings, a program to generate more usage. It's urgent, Mr Chair, because Cathy says, you state that the Norman Park Ferry Terminal is not up to standard. Whose fault is that? 
yours. After all, you are responsible for the ferry terminals. Suggesting we use other public transport is an insult as it is so infrequent on weekends and after six at night. It's urgent because Gregory says this is yet another decision by this out of touch council. Change this decision. Rowland says, if this behaviour is not challenged and halted, who knows what is next in their sights? Councillor Cook, your time has expired. On the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter to be urgent, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. Aye. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy. Councillor Cook, please ring the bells. Councillors, all councillors are present. All those in favour of the matter of urgency, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Thank you. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being seven in favour and 19 against. The noes have it. Uh, point of order, uh, Mr Chair. Point of order, uh, Councillor Hutton. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, which only commences when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. I have a, a resolution that this Council now adjourn for the purpose of afternoon tea for a period of 15 minutes, uh, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. It's been moved by, uh, moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Welcome back, councillors. We will now conduct the vote for the Establishment Coordination Committee report, please. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Planning and Economic Development Committee, please. The Deputy Mayor. Papers everywhere. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the report of the City Planning and Economic Development Committee meeting dated the Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, the Deputy Mayor? Yes. Thank you, Mr Chair. And look, I just want to speak about a couple of things before I actually get to the report itself. Um, the first one being I'd just also like to thank the team in international relations and the amazing work that they do, not only for what we were talking about earlier today in the continuation of the relationships with our sister cities and developing those economic, social and cultural ties, but for their amazing work that they did with the Asia Pacific City Summit 2019 with uh, Kurilan conventions to be a awarded the um, event of the year, the convention of the year for the Asia Pacific Summit uh, 2019. Um, it was awarded to a congress or a conference that best advances the aims of organising body and provides a rewarding experience for attendees. The judges said the event had such a strong and clear purpose, which clearly defined goals for the conference. And I could not have summed it up better myself. The conference was fantastic. Uh, I think the, uh, the brainwave of having a koala in the foyer of the convention centre from Lone Pine, which then obviously we had trouble keeping everyone in the convention centre because they all just wanted to go and visit Lone Pine. Um, we really did actually uh, premiere Brisbane as well as the City Summit as well. So can I just say congratulations to Teen Up and in International Relations and to Ashley Gordon and the team of Carillon Conference Management as well. An event coming up this weekend, uh, and it's interesting we hear from those opposite complaining time and again that we don't get 
to see what's happening. And so here I am, and none of them are here from afternoon tea. Obviously, coffee and tea took a little bit longer than the 10 minutes um, that we had for our break. Uh, to talk about some economic recovery uh, opportunities that are coming up this weekend, we have the shop b and &E City. Now, this is something that we have run for the last five years, but I think this year it's more important than ever that you can support our COVID struck retailers in the CBD and help them rebuild after the economic impacts that we've seen. Uh, so Queen Street Mall, as we've heard, particularly if, in your, if you're in my committee, has been particularly hit as a shopping precinct, even though some people are then turning the spending to their suburban shops and enjoying finding out about their locals, as we heard from Councillor Allen earlier today. What we are seeing in the Queen Street Mall, particularly around the city heart, is that when people haven't come back to work and haven't come back to the offices, that it's really difficult for coffee shops and retailers to keep the foot traffic up and keep the money coming through the day. So this is an event that happens every year, but it's a particularly large one for this year that the Brisbane Economic Development Agency is really driving to bring out everyone, all stops to encourage residents to come out and enjoy the city over Friday, Saturday, and and Sunday, there is going to be three days of exclusive retail discounts, Councillor Marks. Hope you're listening. Um, there is going to be pop-up bars and live entertainment. Hope you're listening, Councillor Murphy. Um, next hotel is going to open up its pool to the general public and transfer, transform it into an urban oasis. Live music, food and drinks offers. Jimmy's on the Mall is going to be transformed into an Italian-inspired gardens. There is going to be retro-themed departure lounges. There's going to be musicians front and centre at all of our City Live music stages and there is over 70 exclusive offers that will be available over the three-day event. So if you're thinking early about getting out and getting organised for Christmas that is actually two months away as of Sunday, goodness help us, now is the time. Support our city heart. Think about the weekend to come down from this Friday and really support those businesses to get back on their feet as we go into that Christmas season as well. Also within the city heart, but becoming the heart of what is going to become a very big organisation of business hubs and network hubs as well, is the Brisbane Business Hub that we spoke about last Tuesday in committee, uh, launched on that Tuesday morning and spoke about in council as well. Uh, it is being facilitated by Brisbane Economic Development Agency through the Economic Recovery Task Force, and uh, the Lord Mayor would have spoken about that. You would have heard through budget as well. The idea is that all businesses, small, medium and large, will have access to a range of business information from local experts ranging from marketing and operations, human resources and finance. You can get a business health check, transformational guidance, advice on growing, building more resilient businesses. Make sure you can check in for your latest business COVID-19 updates. Learn all about recovery grants, whether they're from us or other levels of government as well, stimulus initiatives, and basically just never Network with like businesses and other businesses on how to overcome the funding challenges and accessing financing capital and customers into the future. It's very, very exciting. I know it's busy already. We had a meet uh, the planner day organised the day after the opening and it was booked out a week in advance. So there is a website. I encourage you to get on the website, share it with your residents, please. They'll be coming to a suburbs near you as well. And uh, we really want to support our businesses out of this and we want to be the most business friendly uh, city in Australia and this is going a long way to making sure we do that. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Thank you Mr Chair. I'd like to uh, join the debate on item A related to the Brisbane Business Hub. Um, since the formation of the Economic Recovery Task Force, I've had the opportunity to engage with a wide range of businesses, industry groups and community groups to hear firsthand how COVID is impacting their organisations and members. Research was undertaken, as outlined in this presentation, to inform Council's response to COVID and the formulation of the Economic Recovery Plan. One of the common themes that emerged was that they needed support in the reboot and recovery phases. Support was required in a range of areas, including reducing business costs, helping to source customers, identifying opportunities, developing new skills and sourcing advice. With this in mind, the concept of the Brisbane Business Hub was formulated. 
I've had the opportunity to visit, to visit the Brisbane Business Hub and last week attended the opening. In my view, it is a terrific use of the space that is well configured and well located to aid all Brisbane businesses in need of support, be they large or small. The space lends itself to a wide range of uses, including seminars, coaching, networking events, workshops, the list goes on. An extensive list of programs and events is currently being developed to support local businesses, covering a wide range of functional disciplines such as marketing, HR, strategy, as I mentioned, a very lengthy list. Importantly, many of Brisbane's best known businesses and business people have stepped up to support and partner with the Brisbane Business Hub to support the economic recovery of the city. As noted in the presentation, the Brisbane Business Hub is a joint initiative between Brisbane City Council and the Brisbane Economic Development Agency, with the hub being managed on a day-to-day -day basis by Brisbane EDA. I would encourage all councillors in this chamber to visit the hub, familiarise yourself with the services and encourage your local businesses to avail themselves of the resources available. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, the Deputy Mayor. I'll now put, uh, put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Public and Active Transport Committee, please. Councillor Murphy. Thanks, Chair. I move that the uh, report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Murphy, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the report of the Public and Active Transport Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Murphy. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. I uh, just wanted to talk about our presentation last week, which was on the Brisbane Metro project. So uh, before I go into what was discussed as part of the presentation, I'd just like to update the Chamber on some exciting news. Uh, the Brisbane Metro is a finalist in the City's Power Partnership Innovation Award. The City's Power Partnership is Australia's largest network of cities and towns tackling climate change. It involves 140 local government areas, it involves 500 cities and towns, and it has 50% of Australians represented within its jurisdictions. The Innovation Award is about transformative climate solutions, which the fully electric Brisbane Metro vehicle is. I'll be attending the awards evening virtually on Teams uh, this Thursday evening from the safety and comfort of my own home, uh, but that in no way diminishes the massive achievement of Council being a finalist. And I'd like to thank the Brisbane Metro team on behalf of Council for their work on this uh, project. Part of the citation for Council's entry speaks to the massive uh, evidence-based changes that we've seen in the project from uh, conception to now being in the delivery phase. The opposition will often um, cite the project's major changes in scope as one of its drawbacks, but we've always said that the changes have only ever improved the project and its value offering to Brisbane residents. It's good to see one of the nation's largest climate NGOs to back that up. Moving to the presentation, this was of course the first update uh, on Brisbane Metro for the Public and Active Transport Committee this term. As we all know, the Brisbane Metro will be a key part of Brisbane's greater transport network, connecting the city to our suburbs with a rapid turn up and go service. Since 2017, there's been some significant engagement with the Queensland Government, resulting in more than 500 meetings and briefings. Following the application to the Department of Transport and Main Roads, the uh, Director General Neil Scales and the execution of the State Project Deed and Construction Interface Deed approval was granted under Section 311 of the Transport Infrastructure Act 1994 for the collaborative partnership to undertake works on the Queensland Government's busway. As discussed during the committee, there's been a lot of additional conditions put onto Council by the State for us to be able to upgrade and to provide this faster, more efficient turn up and go system for Brisbane. The delays and additional conditions have added to the cost of the project and for the sign-off to come the 11th hour before the state election proves that these additional delays could have been avoided and the cost to the ratepayer could have been significantly less. Project Director Stephen Hammer spoke about the Brisbane Move Consortium. The collaborative partnership comprises Asiona Construction, Australia Proprietary Limited and Arab Australia Projects. Brisbane Move, the collaborative partnership, will deliver the Cultural Centre Station and Precinct upgrades, the Victoria Bridge upgrades, 
public realm improvements and traffic and transport changes to North Quay, the Adelaide Street vision, including the Adelaide Street Tunnel Works from North Quay to King George Square Station, and finally, end of route facilities, uh, one of which will be at uh, Ernie's Roundabout, which we voted on earlier uh, today. Speaking of our collaborative partnership, I can also advise the Chamber that the CEO was able to sign off on the deed for the CP contract last week. Uh, this partnership agreement could not be signed off until after the State Government had given their approval, and I'm pleased to say that Brisbane Metro is now, finally, after several years, after 500 meetings, after numerous redesigns, Brisbane Metro is happening. As part of the CP arrangements, the Brisbane Metro project team here on Ann Street will now deploy to the CP offices at the corner of Melbourne Street and Maryvale Street. There, they will work closely, hand in hand, in the true spirit of collaboration to build this project and deliver the turn up and go public transport solution that our city needs. Of course, Chair, uh, our depot work started at the end of last year and design and construct request for tender was released in August this year. Depot will be located on five parcels of land owned by Council, three parcels of land uh, gazetted by the Queensland Government in September 2020 for acquisition, and a TMR-owned parcel of land to be purchased by Council later this year. The depot will be used for stabling, maintenance and overnight charging of the Brisbane Metro vehicles. One of the things that I find most exciting about this project is the vehicle. The Lord Mayor announced last year that it would be fully electric in line with our clean and green vision uh, for our city. So it's great news uh, for Brisbane Metro, and um, I'm really looking forward uh, to getting it underway and seeing the project take shape across all the various work sites in the city. Um, just another portfolio item, uh, Chair, while I uh, go around. I've um, taken the opportunity during the state election to conduct a little bit of a um, literature review of some of uh, the Greens' state candidate materials as it pertains to public and active transport projects around our city, and would you believe, um, once again, we have the Greens taking credit for things outside their jurisdiction. Um, I want to uh, take you through just three flyers that have come past my desk in recent weeks, and I'll start with um, actually one of the better ones, and this is the uh, flyer, joint flyer between uh, Jonathan Shree and Amy McMahon. It's called uh, Our Vision for South Brisbane, and um, gee, it's got some good stuff in it, Councillor Shree. So um, there's 13 projects in the flyer. Um, one, keep the Gabba station in public hands. So that's a state project. Uh, number two, footbridge from West End to Tuong, council project. Uh, number three, a new east-west and north-south city glider routes. So that's a council project. Number four is um, upgrade the 192 bus route to a high-frequency service, council project. Uh, number five is a new city cat terminal near Victoria Street, council project. Uh, new riverside parklands to replace old industrial sites along Montague Road, which is a council project. Well, I suppose it would be a council or a state project, depending on who uh, would resume the site, and certainly uh, we don't have that power. Um, number seven is to complete the Kangaroo Point Riverwalk, which is a council project. Um, number eight is uh, turn the Bogo Road Jail Precinct into a visual and performing arts hub. I'm going to give that to the state. I'm going to give that one to the state. I know it could be a council project, but let's give it to the state just for the benefit of the doubt. Um, number nine is an Aboriginal cultural centre at Musgrave Park. Uh, probably a council project. Uh, Lord Mayor certainly uh, expressed his interest in that. Uh, number 10, separated bike lanes along Vulture Street, which Council Shree and I have been talking about, uh, council project. Uh, number 11 is expand East Brisbane State School, which is a state project. Number 12, uh, upgrade O'Keefe Street and Logan Road Roundabout, which is a council project. And number 13, create a new park in Highgate Hill, which is a council project. So out of 13 projects and commitments that Amy McMahon is making at this election, 10 are uh, council projects and three uh, states. So I'm going to give that a C. Um, then I've got, now I've got, uh, I'm going to give that a C. So we've also got now here, I've got Victor Hummel. He's a um, dashing looking candidate for Green Slopes here. And um, he's got nine commitments in his brochure, Our Vision for Green Slopes. Um, now, of the projects, fully fund Green Slopes State Schools, state project. Create new public parks in Green Slopes and Cooparoo, council project. Establish two new high frequency bus routes, council project. Re engineer the Cooparoo train level crossing. I'm going to give that to the state, state project. Um, expand the 173 and 203 bus services, um, council project. Protect Stevens Mountain Reserve from development, council, council project. Uh, tick, I think that's already achieved, but um, improve cycling infrastructure on Old Cliven Road, council project. 
uh, establish a cultural entertainment hub in Stones Corner. I'm going to give it to the state because otherwise they're not going to have many in this list and fix the O'Keefe Street roundabout, uh, which is a council project. So I'm going to give Victor Hummel a B. Well done, Victor Hummel. He actually, uh, but I know, I, some say I am too generous, Councillor Cunningham, but um, I'm going to say I'm not going to be generous about the next one uh, because um, the next one is called Maywa Matters. It's Michael Berkman's uh, newsletter and I was really shocked when I open this one because while Councillor Sri uh, was saying this is our vision and you know visions are things that you deliver in collaboration with other levels of government, I think uh, we can all agree that that's fair enough. Um, and Victor Hummel was making election commitments. Michael Berkman has, uh, has claimed something altogether different. He's written what we've delivered, what we've delivered. And let's kick off with the first one. Green Bridges. Michael Bergman has delivered funding for two new green bridges from Tawonga St Lucia to West End. N not, not I'm going to do this, not I'm fighting for it, but he has personally delivered funding for green bridges. So um, I'm very much, very much looking forward to the rivers of gold that will flow from the state government if the Greens hold the balance of power after Saturday's election. Uh, Mr Chair, and, and uh, God hope that they don't, but um, I am so, so uh, shocked and appalled that Michael Bergman would try to claim a council project. Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner's signature project that he announced on the day that he took over the mayoral chains as something that he, uh, Michael Bergman, the member for Maywa, had uh, delivered. But it, um, it doesn't stop there. He also claims that he stopped the zip line, uh, that he personally stopped uh, the zip line. That was actually the only mention of the LNP council. Weirdly, he didn't mention us on Green Bridges, but he did mention us in regards to the zip line. So very generous there. Uh, and also he claimed credit for a new direct bus route from Barden, Auckland Flower and Paddington to Kelvin Grove, uh, which I know councillors uh, in this place have been working on. Uh, uh, Councillor Murphy, Matty. your time and, uh, has oh, expired. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Are there any uh, further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on item A, the Brisbane Metro project update. After almost five years, um, it is uh, astonishing that Councillor Murphy is standing up and claiming um, that the Brisbane Metro is um, a successful project for Council. This is a project that was poorly conceived um, back in 2016 uh, and since it was announced as a thought bubble at the 2016 election. The LNP administration under the leadership of Adrian Schrinner uh, as the deputy mayor responsible for the project and now Lord Mayor, who also did not return from afternoon tea, um, uh, has thoroughly botched the delivery of the Metro. The outcome of what this LNP have done um, is somewhere in the vicinity of 400 million or 500 million more than council estimated of the $944 million budget originally announced. Half, up to half a billion dollars of ratepayers funds have been wasted, wasted um, by this LNP administration on their botched handling of this project. The project was poorly scoped. It's changed so many times from uh, rail to light rail to buses. Um, it's been poorly managed. Um, tenders were put out before the approval of the landholders to actually deliver the project were sought, um, causing tenders that had cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, um, to be aborted at the last minute. Um, costing major contractors um, in Australia and overseas millions of dollars, which Council had to refund part of those costs. It is astonishing, astonishing that this administration continues to claim that they are doing a good job on the Metro. Uh, in addition to um, the poor conception, the poor scope, the poor management, um, the outcome of this project delivers less than was originally promised. One of the biggest issues has been um, the underground link under Melbourne Street. That has just been cut altogether. Uh, we're going to get an at-surface 
uh, a solution uh, that basically at the time it is delivered is inadequate to manage the buses um, that will go through it. That's clearly in the business case um, that was released on the change of scope. It is unacceptable that Council is spending up to half a million dollar more um, for a worse project for Brisbane ratepayers. And what do we get from Councillor Murphy? A bunch of schoolboy Liberal politics about the Greens. It is just astonishing that this administration um, wants to talk about those issues, but wants to avoid um, the serious problems with the Metro. Now, that doesn't even take into account that a foreign company is delivering Brisbane City Council's major infrastructure project in the state. Yes, there are local partners, um, but uh, certainly the idea that this council will be working, as the Lord Mayor often says, um, with local contractors is certainly not the case when it comes to Brisbane's biggest infrastructure project. The Brisbane Metro then fails to deliver for the south side of Brisbane. Southsiders who have currently direct bus services to the University of Queensland will lose those bus services um, and they will be forced to go into the Marta Hill area, change buses and loop back to the University <coughs> of Queensland. It is astonishing that this administration has not included a link to the University of Queensland from the south side. It is shameful. We don't know yet how many other bus services are going to be truncated at South Brisbane, and I fear that my residents are going to be significantly disadvantaged. Um, the alignment of this route does not um, deliver for elderly residents who need um, access into uh, certain parts of the city that they currently have. This administration has still not released any details about the impacts of the changes to the bus timetables, to bus routes and bus services, and yet the um, uh, chairman stands up and crows about the delivery of this project. Uh, it is not good enough that bus services are going to be cut, and this LNP administration has failed to be transparent with Brisbane residents about how their local bus services will be impacted. We know that at least 125 bus services are going to be cut. That was what was in the original business case. It could be a lot more today, but you won't find the LNP discussing cuts to bus uh, services. They'll do what they did last time in 2012. There will be a secret memo um, go after ENC signs off on it up to George Street where they say cut these bus services uh, to the Minister for Transport. That's what they did in 2012. They cut the 101, they cut the 102, they cut services on the 104 route, they cut back services on the 116 route. It is unacceptable, unacceptable that this administration refuses to tell us how the Brisbane Metro is going to impact on bus services. We will hear them stand up and crow day after day about, oh, well, the suburbs will get better bus services. Tell us. Tell us what they will be. Release the services that are going to be cut. Release the services that are going to be cancelled. Release the services that are going to be truncated. And tell us which suburban services are going to be improved. Because none of that information is in the public sphere. What do we get from the chairperson? Schoolboy politics about the Greens. So let me be clear. The Brisbane Metro has been an absolute debacle for this LNP administration. Uh, it is um, five years of stuff up after stuff up that has cost Brisbane ratepayers up to half a billion dollars. They're getting less infrastructure and they're getting bus cuts that they won't come clean about. That is absolutely not good enough. Not good enough. And every time um, the chairman brings this report in here and talks about the Metro, the truth of it is going to be raised. It is simply unacceptable um, that the blowouts, the cost blowouts on this project, which mean that every other project we want happening to improve local roads, to improve safety on bikeways, to fix footpaths, there's no money for that because this LNP administration have spent 
somewhere pretty close to uh, half a billion dollars on trying to patch up a project that they have botched from the beginning. I don't think that is anything to be proud of, and I understand why Councillor Murphy would rather play schoolboy politics and attack the Greens instead of taking ownership of this um, botched project. Further speakers? Anyone? Councillor Murphy. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report, please. Councillor McLaughlin. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. I um, rise to move the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 20th of October, 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor McLaughlin, seconded by Councillor Hutton. The report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 20th of October, 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Before I get to the matters before us in the agenda, I'd just like to uh, address a question that was put to the Lord Mayor in question time from Councillor Johnson about um, speed uh, reviews on Ipswich Road at Annerley. Um, as the Chamber will be aware, we're installing traffic lights at the intersection of Ipswich Road and Ponsonby Street as a result of the accident rate that's been recorded there and the funding provided by the Federal Government through the Black Spot Program. Um, this is a, an intersection, or the intersection is one block away from Junction Park State School. And uh, as everyone will be aware that uh, signalised intersections do reduce the speed of vehicles. In fact, they bring them to a stop. And the consequence of this work will be to install a signalised pedestrian crossing across Ipswich Road, uh, close, to junction, um, jun close to the Junction State School, which would be to the benefit of anybody who needs to get across Ipswich Road at that location. So um, I think uh, in the, with that in mind, um, and in relation to the speed limit request that was made prior to the implementation of that black spot program, um, we will uh, still consider a speed reduction on Ipswich Road. But uh, no, in, no interjections. No, Councillor Johnston, no interjections. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, and see what happens as a consequence of the, the construction of the traffic signalised pedestrian crossing at this intersection. Um, Mr Chair, um, it has been an exciting week in, in, in the infrastructure portfolio with the release of the Indrapilly roundabout upgrade business case and, of course, uh, what we saw today with the uh, uh, all lanes on Kingston Smith Drive open for business today. So it's great to see that we're making Brisbane a better place day by day. Uh, transformational projects across the city that are hitting major milestones, making the road network safer and more accessible for all. Um, of course, all road upgrades are born out of planning and investi investigative work, uh, which was the focus of our committee presentation last week. Uh, from little things, big things grow. <laughs> they all start with, uh, with planning, and that's the presentation was on preliminary road design, the prelimi preliminary road design schedule, which is included in Council's budget each year. Uh, we took the opportunity with the presentation last week to look at uh, what has been included in this year's budget, eight locations across the city being investigated under the preliminary road designs program, including roads in Chermside West, Tawong, Wavell Heights and Durack. Um, this, Mr Chair, is the, uh, provides a starting point for future road upgrades, and the goal is to identify potential short-term medium-term and long-term improvements, as well as possible staging op options, conceptual plans and high-level cost estimates. Um, after this, the, uh, the projects can be considered for potential inclusion in future council budgets. Um, the presentation last week took uh, the members of the committee through this year's schedule uh, to understand where the, um, where they, what were the drivers, what were you, the point that we'd reached to with that investigation and what the potential will be for future upgrades in future budgets. So, as I said, um, this provides insights into the first steps that Council takes when undertaking road upgrades, and I recommend that uh, councillors be aware in the program too, the uh, specific item, preliminary road designs, will give uh, all councillors an insight into the starting point for any road works that are being undertaken. Uh, Mr Chair, there were three petitions also presented to the committee last week. Uh, at this stage, I'll leave it to anybody who wants to participate in debate and come back later if necessary. Further speakers? 
Councillor Cassidy. Up and down like a yo-yo. Thank you, Chair. I just ask that um, item C uh, be taken seriatim for voting purposes, please. Item C taken seriatim <coughs> for voting. Yes, thank you. Which is the petition requesting Council decrease the speed limit from 50 kilometres per hour to 40 kilometres per hour <coughs> on Sovereign Place, um, Boondall. Um, Chair, this is a very typical response from this do-nothing administration here. We have local residents uh, in a very local street pleading with council to listen to them. They live in this street. They know it best. It's not a thoroughfare. Uh, reducing the speed here will only affect the residents in that street, and they're the ones that are actually calling for it. So what is going on here? Uh, why won't this administration and this Lord Mayor listen to them? I have. I've met these residents, uh, and I'm supporting them here today. These are the small local changes that can have a positive impact on a community and ones that this LNP administration continue to fail on. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, just briefly on items B, uh, item B, the zebra crossing on Mildmay Street, Fairfield. Um, look, uh, the state government is undertaking a number of major rail station upgrades uh, along the Cross River Rail corridor in my ward, including uh, Dutton Park, Fairfield, Yoronga, Yoronpilly, and there are others um, further away. Uh, it is inconceivable, in my view, um, that there are no pedestrian upgrades to access the station that are included in these projects. Um, it is now some four years on since Graceful uh, Station was upgraded and the fight to get a zebra crossing uh, on a Pell Street continues with inaction from this council. Um, I have spoken to the Cross River Rail team about this matter. I've asked council about this matter and we have done a petition. Um, the pedestrian access across Mildmay Street between Fairfield Rail Station and uh, Fairfield Garden Shopping Centre is an extremely busy one. Not only do people get off the train um, and then walk into the shopping centre, the overpass is a pedestrian thoroughfare for Annerley residents travelling uh, through uh, to Fairfield to the shops, parks and beyond. Um, it is unreasonable that Council will not work with um, the State Government to deliver pedestrian upgrades as part of these rail station upgrades. Um, the Cross River Rail people advised me that Council just refused uh, to include any pedestrian upgrades as part of um, this project. It makes no sense to me that the State and Council will not work together when these station upgrades are done to make sure that there are active travel improvements um, that can be delivered for our community. Um, it, is, it is a matter of despair to me that this Council fails, fails to consider pedestrian upgrades and simply says, no, we're not going to do anything. Our community has spoken up. They want a safe crossing point in this location. Um, there are a huge amount of vehicles going in and out of this area every day, and we want um, safe access for pedestrians and cyclists who are moving to and from the station, to and from the shops, and between Annerley and Fairfield. So I just want to put on the record, it says that I support the recommendation in here, which is to do a pedestrian count. That's not actually what I said, so I'm going to table what I said and put on the record what I think should be happening. Dear Matthew, I support the petition re response, but just note that I actually support the zebra crossing. Council need to install a zebra crossing in this location. Pedestrian safety should be included in the station upgrades as a matter of course. Council um, and the um, uh, Queensland Rail people and the Cross River Rail Authority have officers who are working together. What is the point of that if they are not considering safety upgrades for pedestrians so we can get people safely to public transport? I am so lucky to have two fantastic, well, technically three rail lines, but two really good um, commuter uh, rail lines in my ward. And we want to get people on public transport. We want to get people safely to that public transport. And improving their access, improving their ability to get to the station and across the rail line so that they can enjoy community life and get access to the parks and the shops and the churches that's what we want. 
and I'm sick of the inaction by this council when this is a simple measure um, that needs to be done. I, 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 feel, I feel very sad because this response will be, yep, there's only like how many people cross there, it's not enough, we're not going to do anything. Um, I'm, I'm guessing, I've got my crystal ball out. I can tell you, like Graceful, I will not be going away on this. Um, residents in my ward support public transport, they support walkable neighbourhoods, they support active transport, and we want to see better connections to public transport across council roads to facilitate safe, active travel. So uh, on that matter as well, um, I seek leave to suspend standing orders to enable me to move uh, the following urgency motion. Um, oh God, which I've just sent and now I've lost. Um, that uh, council reduces the speed limit on Ipswich Road annually to 50 kilometres immediately. And I'll second that. <coughs> There's an urgency motion that's been moved by uh, Councillor Johnston and seconded by Councillor Griffiths. I understand that's being distributed to councillors at the moment. Councillor Johnson, three minutes of urgency, please. Uh, this is an urgency resolution. Please limit your comments to why this matter is urgent. Uh, yes, Johnson. this matter is urgent uh, because I asked the Lord Mayor a question in question time earlier today about what's happened to the speed reduction that's been long promised on Ipswich Road uh, at Annerley. And uh, the Chair, Councillor McLaughlin, has stood up and said it's now on hold pending the traffic lights on Ponsonby Street at Annerley. Now, I've had numerous discussions with senior council officers and their advice to me was uh, that the reduction for 50 kilometres an hour through Annerley Junction was supported by council and it was going to be put to the Speed Limit Review Committee, which comprises a council officer a officer from the Department of Main Roads and a police officer. I was advised that that's what was being done just a few weeks ago. Um, and I can see Councillor McLaughlin shaking his head. If that is the case, and Ipswich Road annually is not being reduced to 50 kilometres an hour, as I have been told, why have I not been updated about this matter? Annerley uh, residents... Councillor Johnston, I appreciate... No, Councillor Johnston, I'm speaking. Um, I appreciate that you're making comments about the nature of your um, proposal. However, the, the matter at hand is urgency, and I ask you once again to return to urgency, please. And it's urgent because this is new advice today. Um, we've been told that this matter was going back to the Speed Limit Review Committee, um, and it would be considered for 50 kilometres an hour, and that's what Council was recommending. It now turns out, based on Council McLaughlin's advice, that Council has uh, either withheld or cancelled or not doing anything about it because they're undertaking an upgrade at Ponsonby Street that not a single person in 12 years has ever asked me for. It's irrelevant to the speed limit through the junction. And I want to know why Council has cancelled um, the 50 kilometre an hour recommendation for Ipswich Road at Annerley, and it is <laughs> urgent that this council debates the matter so we can improve road safety along Ipswich Road in Annerley. Councillors, on the matter of urgency, all those who believe this matter to be urgent, say aye. Aye. Those against, say no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Cassidy. Please ring the bells. Councillors, all councillors are present. Uh, all those in favour of the matter of urgency, please say aye and raise your hands. Aye. And those against, please say no and raise your hands. Aye. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the notes have it. The voting being seven in favour and 19 against. The notes have it. Councillor Johnson, do you require the balance of your presentation? Yes. Further speakers, Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak in relation to item A. Council is committed to upgrading high priority network links, including road and intersection upgrades, the focus of this presentation. Robust planning and design is essential. And this year, as Councillor McLaughlin mentioned, we will be investigating eight intersections across our city. 
I was delighted to hear the intersection connecting Boundary, Formation and Tile Streets in Wacol will be considered as part of this program. Boundary Road, for those of you who don't know, provides a north-south connection through two industrial estates in Carroll Park and Wacol. These industrial estates are well connected with access to the Logan Motorway to the south and Ipswich Motorway to the north. Almost 30,000 vehicles per day use Boundary Road, with 20% heavy vehicles, including semi-trailers, B-doubles and vehicle carriers. It is the intersection connecting Tile and Formation Street where this design will be focused, while considering the larger corridor through to Boundary Road. Unfortunately, over the past five years, this intersection has seen 10 crashes, resulting in one hospitalisation, eight people requiring medical treatment and three minor injuries. Councillor design... Johnson, please, please don't interject on the councillor. Councilor this Hayden. design will improve traffic congestion, road safety and active transport access accessibility, specifically considering expanding the roundabout to cater for 26 metre B doubles, additional cycle lanes and pedestrian footpaths. This investment in robust planning will not only help hundreds of businesses, some of the largest being Sealy Australia, Easter Transport, National Masonry and Hitachi Construction, it will also improve those immediately adjoining the intersection, including Carroll Park State School, Forest Lake Junior Rugby League Football Club and Ella Grove Residence, Residential Community. We know that an effective transport network delivers economic, social and environmental benefits, reduces the cost of goods and services while improving amenity and convenience. This project will inform a longer term upgrade in the area and will benefit more than just local residents, but the business community too. I want to thank the Chair, Councillor McLaughlin, and Council officers for their work on the project thus far. I look forward to seeing the designs in the near future. Further speakers? I see no further speakers, Councillor McLaughlin. I'll now put the resolution for items A, B and D. All those in favour of A, B and D, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it on item C. As the ayes have it on items A, B and D. And on item C, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, please say no. no. The ayes have it. Division, Division. Caller, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook, please ring the bells. Councillors, uh, all councillors are present. I will now uh, put that resolution again on all those in favour of item C, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Clerk, please uh, read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 19 in favour and 7 against. The ayes have it. Councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee report, please. Councillor Cunningham. Thanks, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cunningham, seconded by Councillor Hutton. The report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Cunningham? Mr Chair, our committee presentation last week was on sustainable water use and drought response planning. Now, it might seem like a strange topic given the weather outside at the moment and indeed predictions of a La Nina event in coming months, but Dorothy McKellar famously wrote, we are a country of droughts and flooding rains. To be a truly resilient city, we must plan for drought during times of rain and vice versa. And Council is certainly doing everything we can to ensure our city can stand up to whatever Mother Nature sends our way. During the recess, the SEQ water grid capacity actually dropped below 60%. It means we entered a period of voluntary restrictions, with a focus on encouraging the community to become more water aware and reduce their water use wherever possible. SEQ Water and Urban Utilities jointly are the lead agencies when it comes to delivering communication and education on behaviour change and water restrictions and compliance. Council plays a supporting role in encouraging the community to reduce water use and also looks to lead by example in reducing our own water use. The presentation highlighted some of Council's water saving initiatives. 
For example, fountains that have been built with new modern technology to minimise water loss. Additionally, Council has built approximately 400 megalitres of stormwater capacity at around 30 assets across Brisbane to irrigate our parks and gardens. Also in the committee report are four petition responses. First, requesting that Council extend the dog off-leash area in Sedgley Park at Alderley. Another, requesting that Council relocate the dog off-leash area within Belimba Riverside Park. Another one requesting that Council provide improvements and an additional track at the BMX facility located in Chelmer Recreation Reserve. And the final one requesting that Council install lighting and refurbish the basketball facility in Milton Park at Milton. I'll leave the rest to the Chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak on item D, the petition um, requesting improvements at the BMX track facility located in the Chelmer Rec Reserve on Oxley Road at Chelmer. And I acknowledge and say hello to those people watching at home tonight, including uh, the Bellamy Wells family and friends. Um, this is your item we are on now. Um, I'm so pleased to speak to this matter today and I want to let the Chamber and all Brisbane residents know about how this matter came about. I think the best thing to do today is to read uh, the letter uh, that I wrote um, about what happened with respect to this request. Um, and I, I think it'll make sense to residents uh, as I read it. So I'm writing to the year coordinator of uh, Year 10 St Peter's Lutheran College. I'm writing to let you know about the wonderful advocacy work of St Peter's student Lewis Bellamy Wells has undertaken recently in my local community. Uh, uh, the Bellamy Wells are my constituent and live in Chelmer. In January this year, Lewis wrote to my office with a request to upgrade the Chelmer BMX track. He put together a detailed and well-written submission to support his request. In my view, the submission was of an extremely high quality. And if I did not know he was 15 at the time, he's 16 now, I think, uh, I would have assumed it was written by a professional stakeholder group. It contained photos, it contained um, information about why the upgrade was needed, uh, it was reasoned, it was thorough, it was a very impressive piece of work. At that point, Council was reluctant to upgrade the Chilmer BMX track. Uh, so Lewis and I discussed how we could use community advocacy to pressure Council into acknowledging the need and the benefits of a better BMX track for young people in the district. I advised Lewis about Council's petition process and how the matter would then be considered by all councillors at a Council meeting, and that's what we're doing today. Lewis went away and put an e-petition together and circulated within our community, community, garnering great support. Hundreds of local residents responded to Lewis's request uh, and signed this petition. Uh, the petition um, was discussed within Council and whilst a large upgrade due to cost and environmental constraints was not possible, due to Lewis's advocacy, a compromise was reached for a smaller uh, but significantly improved BMX facility. Lewis then worked directly with Council's Parks officers and a big thank you to Dean and all the officers at Park South and with the contractors to help scope the project, providing some advice on how children and young adults use the facility and what would be helpful in the upgrade, ensuring that it met the needs of young people of all ages who use the BMX track. We officially opened the track a few weekends ago and the feedback from all the young people and their parents has been phenomenal. I cannot tell you how impressed I am with the way in which Lewis has undertaken this project. His efforts are a wonderful reflection of a capable and smart young man. At any point, Lewis could have given up, but didn't. I hope his actions serve as a reminder to young people that while they may not be able to vote until they are 18, they have a voice and they have the power to affect change for the benefit of our community. I want to acknowledge today Lewis's um, uh, commitment, thoughtful approach and follow-up in helping to secure, design and deliver the wonderful community access, asset that is the upgraded Chilmer BMX track. Lewis is a credit to St Peter's, his school, to his family and I hope, um, and I hope his work in improving our local community can be recognised by his school. 
We are recognising it here today in the chamber. Uh, Lewis's contributions will now form part of the record of the debate on this matter today. And I just want to say, um, and this might be of interest to Lewis, and I hope it makes him feel even um, prouder, I had someone who saw our interactions on Facebook come to me by email and say, Nicole, I want an upgrade um, for Fairfield. And I said, yep, absolutely. Um, let's get a petition together. This is what we need to do. This is how we did it over in Chelmer. And this was an adult. Haven't heard a peep from that adult in terms of um, upgrades over there. I cannot tell you how impressed I have been. I know that his family will be very proud of him. Um, he's done a great service for young people in our community. Um, there's still a couple of little things council need to fix. I think there's a seat still to go in and some signage that they need to fix. Um, but I just want to say that whilst we didn't get exactly what Lewis wanted. He's been an integral part of the process. He has helped secure an outstanding outcome for our community. Um, it demonstrates that young people can have a voice um, in the democratic process and in community life. And I just want to thank him um, and his family who have supported him through the process. I know his mum's been encouraging behind the scenes, but I know it's Lewis that's done the hard work. Um, I just want to say to all the councillors here today um, that this is a young man we can be very proud of, and I'm very pleased that we've been able to deliver on this upgraded um, BMX track in Chelmer, um, which is just being loved to death by the young people in my community. Uh, so a big thank you uh, to all the Parks uh, South officers who are involved, the contractors, and to Lewis and his family. Further speakers? Councillor Maddock. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak in uh, item E, which is a petition requesting that Council install lighting and refurbish the basketball facility in Milton Park at Milton. Uh, Mr Chairman, this petition was received during the winter recess uh, and it contains uh, 49 signatures of local residents uh, who are asking that Council um, assess the half uh, basketball court and look at installing lighting as well as part of the process. Uh, Mr Chairman, for the benefit of the Chamber, Milton Park is a very popular local park. It has a number of facilities that are attractive to the local area. There is a um, all abilities playground. Uh, there's a dog off leash park for both large and small dogs. Uh, there's a netball court and a half size basketball court and then some shelters and picnic areas. Um, and so it does get a lot of use all year round. Um, but of course during um, the autumn and winter periods uh, it starts to get darker earlier. And we do have uh, a lot of younger people within that Auckland flower area uh, that I love to get out and play sport, and as a council we encourage it, but during those periods of the year it does get darker, uh, and so their ability to play longer uh, is curtailed. Uh, despite uh, the darkness, though, their passion for basketball sees through, and so a lot of them are playing in the dark, which I think we would all agree is, is not suitable. And so through this petition, they brought uh, to our notice the importance of this upgrade. I did speak with council officers uh, about this petition and looking for options and was informed at the time that there was already money in the, in the budget for a general upgrade of lighting within the park, uh, but that unfortunately it did not include this uh, basketball court. And so I thought that given the importance of this uh, local facility to recreation and through uh, this meaningful uh, engagement by petition by these local residents, that it was important to try and meet that need. And so I thought it was appropriate in conversation with the officers that if they already had contractors out there upgrading the lighting, it was the best uh, timing to incorporate the lighting of this basketball court as well. And so through um, the, the generous uh, um, grant that the Lord Mayor applies to, through the Suburban Enhancement Fund, I was able to provide the allocated funding. The officers undertook an investigation as to what the cost would be. Uh, and so there's a figure of 50,000 which is set out uh, in this response. Um, and so there was adequate funding within that uh, allocation of, of grant monies to be able to contribute towards this. This is uh, ultimately a great outcome for the local community and for these 49 signatories on so many levels, uh, having their voices heard, uh, firstly, uh, enhancing our local facilities, and as all councillors know, that's an important part of our roles, to continue to provide improvements to our local amenity, uh, and also uh, 
making sure that our infrastructure continues to meet a standard uh, and that meet the, and that uh, and a compliance level as well through that process. So this is a win-win for the local community. I, I couldn't be more pleased as the local councillor to be able to facilitate this outcome and to work in collaboration uh, with these local residents in meeting their needs and importantly also uh, with our local parks officers who do a great job of constantly assessing and upgrading our parks uh, but being able to contribute extra funding to that outcome and enhancing the services that we provide there so that our, uh, this signature park within a local area continues to be an important local asset uh, and enhance uh, our outdoor recreation activity and also build community. So uh, on behalf uh, of, of uh, the officers who were really pleased with the outcome, uh, I'd like to say thank you to these uh, signatories for bringing this to our attention and ultimately for achieving a better outcome for everyone. Thank you. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Cunningham? I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee, please. Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I move that the report of the City Stands Community Health and Safety Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Marks, seconded by Councillor Hutton. The report of the City Standards Community Health and Safety Committee meeting dated Tuesday 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Just briefly, there was a committee presentation about a new piece of equipment that the um, council officers have purchased, which we're calling the Underbridge Unit. Um, it doesn't, that make, name makes light of what it actually is, and I know Councillor Toomey um, is going to get up and potentially give the council chambers a bit of a, a lesson on this, having that, given that he has actually <coughs> had um, a go in this piece of machinery. I'm not sure how he manages to beat me as a deputy, all this good stuff, but anyway, we'll have a conversation with the officers about that later. Um, and there's also two petitions here, which I'm happy to leave to the chamber for debate. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you. Uh, is your card in? Sorry? Yep, yeah, yeah, please proceed. Thank you. Uh, I'd firstly I'd ask for items B, C and D to be taken together for voting purposes. Excuse me, uh, items B, C and D will be taken seriatim for voting. Is that your request? Yes, thanks. Uh, and it will be so. Councillor Cunning, coming, please continue. And I'm speaking in relation to item B, which is the petition requesting the council immediately remove seagrass and algae from the foreshores of Wynnum, Manly and later. Uh, Mr Chair, there, there is a problem along the Esplanade of Winter Manly. For large parts of the year, there's a foul odour which emanates from dead, washed up seagrass and algae along the foreshore. The odour discourages people walking along the Esplanade walking path. And uh, this uh, can discourage people from exercising. Obviously, it's not good for them, not good for their heart, not for their good for their musculoskeletal structure. Even worse, the Esplanade in Winter Manly and later is home to plenty of fish and chip shops and other food and beverage outlets. Uh, on my count, there's four in Wynnum, a five in Manly and two in Lota. Residents and visitors want to eat their food in pleasant surroundings, not suffer foul odours. The risk to the viability of these businesses is real. Council in the past has used suction equipment to remove dead, washed up seagrass and algae from problem areas, such as the notorious junction of the seawall south of the Wynnum jetty. So the technology is available at reasonable cost. Uh, in the junction of the jetty and the seawall, there's an area in which uh, large amounts of uh, seagrass get washed up and it's one of the uh, smelliest places along the whole Esplanade. However, Council generally refuse to clean up anything but the sandy beach areas along the five kilometre Esplanades. And these are only short spaces, probably 50 metres long, the, the longest one. Uh, there's one at Manly called Eastwood Beach, there's Pendanus Beach in Wynnum, and there's the beach near the Breakwater Park at Wynnum Creek. Whilst cleaning these areas is welcome, pardon the pun, it's a drop in the ocean. It does not cover an area badly affected last summer, which was the area opposite Bandstand Park. In this area, a number of stormwater drains jut out into the bay. The rotten, smelly seagrass was thrown over and alongside the concrete encasing the drains. Council refused to take any action to remove the dead seagrass and the area smelt bad. In my view, the odour seems to be getting worse each year and Council needs to act by removing the dead seagrass as soon as it appears. It's a, it's a uh, seasonal problem which starts 
occurring late in the year, probably around November normally. Mr Chair, jurisdictional fights between different levels of government impress no one. The Brisbane City Council needs to adopt the Nike motto and just do it. I oppose the petition response. Further speakers? Anyone at all? Councillor Mackay. Thanks, Chair. I uh, rise to speak very quickly about the petition for the footpath on Jasmine Road, item D. And, Chair, Jasmine Road forms part of what I like to call the semi rural part of Walter Taylor. It's a beautiful part of the world down near Lone Pine. Lone Pine is, in fact, on Jasmine Road. And much of Jasmine Road already has a footpath. But, of course, in other parts of Jasmine Road, it is a great distance between some of the driveways. And it has been difficult to justify putting footpaths there when other parts of Fig Tree Pocket are much more heavily trafficked. The good news, Chair, is I remain committed to the Fix a Footpath Blitz that I started earlier this year. And as part of that, we have um, already filled in a missing link just around the corner from Jasmine Road on the, on the main walking path. And uh, we're looking imminently to have a more missing link installed between Gunnan Street and outside the Lone Pine Sanctuary. Of course, for those people who know Fig Tree Pocket, you would know that Jesmond Road is on what we call the secret back entrance of Fig Tree Pocket State School. It's a 20 metre section where the kids can come out and meet their parents for afternoon school pickup or, of course, drop off in the morning. Now, that is a 60 zone and we are <coughs> trying to get it changed to be a school zone during, obviously, school hours. And if we can do that, Chair, we will encourage more parents to use that as an alternative to the very busy Cubbler Street entry. Now, of course, if we are going to attract people to use that entrance, we need to try and supply that infrastructure. So I am working closely with my asset services team to try and figure out how we can deliver this footpath. And it is really terrific to have the local residents and people around that area get involved with this petition. And it might seem strange that some of the signatories don't actually live on Jasmine Road. But that's not necessary uh, to make this a valid petition because these people live on streets off Jasmine Road and they need to safely traverse to those streets along Jasmine. As I said earlier, it's a great distance between the driveways. So if you're used to semi-rural areas, you would know that you can't just walk straight up a road and into your house. These people walk up a road and then up another road and then into their house. So I am committed to the continuation of footpaths in Fig Tree Pocket and I work very closely with the Mandalay Progress Association and then we try and survey local people to find out where the most important places are to put these footpaths. And Chair, I look forward to trying to deliver as many as we can. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Strunk. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I rise to speak on Clause C, um, the um, reinstatement of the uh, curbside collection by uh, 96 uh, residents. Uh, um, and I just want to, uh, Mr Chair, I just want to, uh, at the outside, say that this petition is just one of many that has been lodged um, over the last number of months uh, by, uh, on behalf of many thousands of residents right across Brisbane. Uh, the 96 uh, that uh, lodged or signed this one, of course, is just uh, uh, another, uh, another one. And there will be more to come, I can assure you. Um, the residents of Brisbane are not going to let this one go. Uh, increase, uh, interesting enough, uh, the one that was presented uh, here today is um, by Councillor Marks back in August, um, whose area of responsibility uh, is chair of, uh, of this area of curbside collection. Uh, now, Mr. Chairman, the Lord Mayor uh, may, not want to, uh, may not want to hear this, but uh, it's time that he actually listened to the ratepayers of Brisbane. Um, the 96 residents who signed this petition don't want to hear that you can't afford it or that you have other priorities because their priorities are their priorities. Um, in some cases, 
the collection that, uh, that happened in 2019-20 uh, were not fulfilled uh, for about 53 suburbs across Brisbane. Mr. Chairman, uh, the uh, yearly cost of a curbside collection uh, working on the uh, last budget allocation works out at around about $270,000 per ward. Um, now, in anyone's terms, of course, that does add up to quite a lot of money, uh, and I wouldn't deny that. But uh, in the scheme of things of the $3.2 billion budget, um, I would have thought that savings could be made elsewhere uh, and that uh, the uh, looking after the humanity of the city would be uh, a reasonably high priority, maybe not the highest priority, but certainly a high priority, um, because illegal dumping is happening, um, and, the, uh, and I'm sure these 96 petitioners probably realize that as well, because they're probably seeing some of that happen around uh, their uh, neck of the woods or where they're living. Um, so I think it's important that we, I know we, we, we come in here, uh, well, uh, my side comes in here and we talk about curbside collection all the time, but there is, um, there is it's, it's important, and I know it's important because there are not too many times that I'm out into the community that I don't run across a few people that are wanting to talk about when is it coming back? Because uh, as for these 96 residents here, they're, they're, um, they're, the impact on them is the same as the rest, and that is that um, we, we accumulate these things probably in our garages and sheds. Uh, we look forward to that once a year collection, um, and uh, when that doesn't happen, um, especially with the 53 suburbs that uh, weren't able to uh, uh, have their collection done last year, and they paid the rates for that collection. Let's not forget this. They actually paid their rates, and part of their rates was supposed to be for that collection. That's what this council contracted for. And to just withdraw it, um, and COVID, yes, I know COVID is something that we're gonna have to live with for a number of years, but I think um, when it comes to um, um, what these residents uh, expect from a council, they expect you to do what you say you're gonna do. And uh, these 96 residents, I'm sure they're think a lot of them are probably thinking that way. So with those, uh, with those comments, I'll... Um Further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on item A, which was the committee presentation... Uh, Councillor Toomey, the, uh, your microphone's on. Please start again. Oh. It is on now. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I rise to speak on item A, uh, which of course in the report was uh, Council's new piece of kit, uh, the MOOG, which is a $1.2 million uh, elevated work platform for inspecting bridges. Um, I want to start off by saying and addressing uh, Council Mark's question, um, it was luck. Oh, I... <laughs> uh, the, the, the piece of equipment that I actually saw, I went out to actually inspect an expansion joint that was rather noisy, so it was keeping a few residents up at night. And uh, of course, while I was there, the Moog, Moog, Moog uh, rolled up. Now, to give you an idea of how impressive this piece of equipment is, uh, it has a 17 metre reach. So effectively, this can reach under three lanes of traffic. Uh, and deploy from one single lane. It was very, very quickly set up, uh, and the technology that is involved in deploying and monitoring and using this piece of uh, equipment, uh, I would have to say was nothing short than impressive. Uh, from the cab, which is a, a basic Scania truck, uh, the driver can see everything that's happening in the bucket, which is below him, under the bridge. Uh, the operator in the bucket has full control of the truck above him. So effectively, he can drive the truck from the bucket below. Uh, it's an amazing piece of equipment. There's obviously two-way communication. Uh, anybody working in the bucket has full three-phase power uh, and can operate chainsaws, welders, um, gas cutters, that kind of thing from underneath uh, underneath the bridge. But obviously that's not what I was there for. Uh, I was there for the expansion joint. 
Uh, but as a piece of equipment and talking to the officers around what they used to have and where they are now is chalk and cheese. I, I, being one of the first councillors to actually see this piece of equipment being deployed and used uh, once it arrived in the country is absolutely fascinating. I have to say the redundancies around the safety for the officers and the person in the bucket uh, is second to none. There are three levels of redundancy in place. It's almost impossible to get stuck in the bucket, uh, which I actually found rather impressive. Uh, obviously, all the monitoring is done uh, by the workers uh, in the bucket from the cab. You, have, you also have some spotters if they're needed, and everything is relayed back to the cab with audio and video, so you have full safety mecha mechanisms in place. I have to say that um, one of the outstanding pieces of uh, information I learnt about this particular vehicle, uh, particular MOOG, is that it can service underneath the Story Bridge. So it can get over the safety fence, whereas our previous piece of equipment could not. Um, so obviously, being a fan of the new piece of kit, I've put my hand up to go over the side of the Story Bridge and not being worried about heights, so I'm hoping that one day I can achieve that goal. But I have to say, uh, for the $1.2 million that Council has invested in this vehicle, uh, and the level of safety that it provides our officers, and the time it saves them, and the ability to actually keep a bridge open, do an inspection uh, at the same time because of the small footprint that the truck takes up, it is absolutely uh, an outstanding piece of equipment, and uh, in my opinion, worth every dollar, and I hope people uh, in the chamber support the item A. Thank you, Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, just very briefly, can I ask, I think at the moment it's items B, C and D are seriatim for they voting. Are. Can I just ask that um, B and C are done together and D is done separately? Uh, B and C together and D separately. Yes, please. And just briefly, on uh, item C, the reinstatement of curbside collection services, um, I strongly support the reinstatement of um, curbside collection services. Um, it was incredibly disappointing that the Lord Mayor made this unilateral decision to cancel our annual curbside collection that so many residents in Brisbane rely on. Um, many suburbs in my area missed out um, earlier this year, including down the Oxley Road corridor, and will miss out for three years. Um, the Lord Mayor can find millions of dollars for prize fights, for advertising, um, you know, for pretty much anything he wants to come up with, including today's um, announcement. Um, and yet one of our core responsibilities is to um, assist residents with uh, waste and rubbish collection in the city. And he's absolutely failing to do that. I think it is an absolute mistake um, and we should be reinstating um, curbside collection services on an annual basis immediately. Uh, and um, I urge uh, all councillors in the LNP to recognise that our fundamental role um, is to provide these basic services to residents, um, not advertising on Facebook, not selling the budget, not TV ads. Um, you know, it's to pick up the rubbish. And we shouldn't have to be arguing over $6 million a year. Um, it's just not, it's not right. So um, I certainly support the reinstatement of curbside collection services as soon as possible. Further speakers? Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. I'm happy to rise to enter the debate on these items as has been discussed. Um, firstly, congratulations to Councillor McClive for your Fix a Footpath Blitz. I'm keen to see I get the monthly re reports of all the footpaths that have been installed across the city and suburbs, and um, I'm keen to see your photos of your, your footpaths coming through. Um, the other... The, Councillor, Councillor Strunk, through you, Mr Chair, had two questions. Well, one, one was a statement, one was a question. So um, he said, Council, the people expect us to do what we said we will do. Well, that's exactly what we are doing, which we said was we were going to postpone the curbside collection, which we have done. And when is it coming back? It's coming back in July 2022. That's exactly what the Lord Mayor has said, and that's what the answer will continue to be. I'm afraid it doesn't matter how many times asked the same question, the answer will generally always remain the same. It doesn't matter who you ask. 
Uh, Councillor Cumming mentioned about the um, Winner Manly foreshore area. So I know he's got the response there in his paperwork about how this has all been playing out across council and state. Um, but I'm going to read some of that information out so it's in the minutes and then the residents of Winner Manly will know what the situation is. So Council has a long-standing maintenance program for this foreshore area that includes regular cleaning and maintenance, limited to the small areas clearly defined by the current marine park permit issued to Council by the Queensland Government. We have a specialised schedule to respond to the seasonal seagrass and algae, and that includes high frequency inspections and beach cleaning activities. However, <coughs> State legislation stipulates strict limitations on council activities in the foreshore area due to the ecological significance of the marine and coastal environment of Moreton Bay. So on the February the 7th, 2020, council wrote to the Honourable Leanne Enoch, MP, Minister for Environment, the Great Barrier Reef, Minister for Science and the Minister for Arts, requesting that the Queensland Government immediately commence appropriate maintenance within their area of responsibility to help solve this issue. A response was received from the Minister on the 6th of April 2020, with an option being that the Queensland Government could consider, consider the offer to extend the area which Council is permitted to maintain. So in reply to this, further correspondence went from the Lord Mayor back to Minister Enoch on the 10th of June 2020, that the Council's position remains the maintenance activity outside the Marine Park Permit remains best place to be managed by the State Government. So, in essence, what's happened is we've told the State Government, reminded the State Government, let's use that language, reminded the State Government that the area that they're requesting that we clean up is within their purview and under their jurisdiction. The letter that's come back again from the Minister basically reiterating that Council is only prepared to consider offer taking on long-standing Queensland Government responsibility if it provides the necessary funding. And again, the Lord Mayor has written to Minister Enoch, thank you for your correspondence, 22nd of September 2020. I'm disappointed that you have again given no indication that the State Government is prepared to address algal blooms and associated odour issues in this area for which it is responsible. As you have stated from the Minister, Council only has an existing approval from your department to maintain a very small portion of the foreshore in separated but highly frequented locations. The remainder of the foreshore, which is below the high water mark where the algae bloom rests, is the responsibility of the State Government as part of the Moreton Bay Marine Park. This area comprising most of the extent has always been a state government responsibility maintained. We will continue to address the issues in the areas that we are responsible for and permitted to maintain. Now, I reiterate my previous advice that Council is only prepared to consider your offer to extend the area. So what they're saying is the state government's happy to give us over this huge area for us to maintain, but here's the kicker, no funding. So basically, again, the state government wants us to take on more of their responsibility and have the ratepayers pay for it. So my question through you, Mr Chair, to the minister is, when is the state government going to step up and do what they're paid to do by the taxpayers? Thank you. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour of item A, please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it on item A. On item B and C together, B and C together, all those in favour say aye. Those against say no. no. The ayes have it. Division, Division called by Division. Councillor Cumming and Councillor Cook. Uh, please ring the bells.
Councillors, all those in favour of item B and C, items B and C, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the uh, voting being um, 18 in favour, six against and one abstention. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, the ayes have it on items B and C. On item D, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no? Aye. The ayes have it. Division, Division called by Councillor Cassidy Division. and Councillor Cook. Please ring the bells. Uh, councillors on item D, all those in favour, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Thank you. And all those against, please say no and raise your hand. No. Those abstaining, please raise your hand. Yep. Thank you. Clerks, please read the result when you're ready. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the uh, voting being 18 in favour, five against and two abstentions. The ayes have it on item D, the ayes have it on items A, B, C and D. Uh, councillors, the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee, please, Councillor Howard. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting held on Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Seconded. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Hutton, the report of the Community Arts and Nighttime Economy Committee meeting dated Tuesday the 20th of October 2020 be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Howard? Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, last week we had the opportunity to attend a tour of the Museum of Brisbane with Renee Grace, the Director of the Museum. And um, may I say through you, Mr Chair, that we missed Councillor Cook, who was of course attending the LGAQ conference, but I understand at previous tours, uh, Councillor Cook has helped the economic um, economy of the Museum of Brisbane quite substantially. So um, I would encourage you, Councillor Cook, to return at some time to do that because there are some fantastic things to be purchased at the Museum of Brisbane and can I encourage all of our colleagues in the chamber to do so. And just to whet your appetite, I will give you a little bit of an idea on what we found on the tour. So we were able to walk through the Storytellers exhibition, which features stories by Victoria Carlos, Simon Cleary, Matthew Condon, Trent Dalton, Nick Earls, Benjamin Law, Hugh Lunn, Kate Morton and Alan Van Nierven. The Storytellers creates an immersive and interactive experience combining historical objects, artworks and written and narrated histories to share Brisbane's many identities. We also saw the Bauhaus Now exhibition, which is on display until April next year. Bauhaus Now brings to life the little known story of how revolutionary ideas of the Weimar Republic in Germany influenced modernist art, design and architecture in Brisbane and Australia. The exhibition reveals the migrant and refugee contribution to Australian life and art history in the interwar period and post Second World War years. Bauhaus Now features original artworks from this period, plus a series of vivid contemporary recreations that demonstrate both the impact of this movement in Brisbane and Australian art history. We also saw the Man and Wars Celeston II exhibition that is on display until the 31st of January 2021. Celeston II extends video work Man and Wa developed during Museum of Brisbane Artists and Home Residency Program, and it's curated amalgamation 
of audio, video and photographic material centred on the cosmic and botanical worlds drawn from the artist's extensive catalogue created over the past seven years. Renee also talked about Museum of Brisbane's current artist in residence, Tori Jay, who will be at the museum until the 6th of December this year. Drawing on both her Torres Strait Islander and English heritage, Tori Jay's contemporary illustrations explore themes of family and self-identity through detailed and immersive portraiture. Tori Jay is working on a large-scale live mural in the Adelaide Street Pavilion and welcomes visitor participation through a digital drawing activity. So thank you to Renee and to the rest of the Museum of Brisbane team for all the wonderful work that they do, and I encourage everyone to take up the opportunity to experience these wonderful exhibitions while they're on display. And, Mr Chair, I commend the report to the Chamber. Further speakers? I see no further speakers. Councillor Howard. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. The ayes have it. Council is the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee, please. Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 20th of October 2020, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that the report of the Finance, Administration and Small Business Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 20th of October 2020, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Before um, moving to the report, I did want to touch upon something, uh, a point that Councillor Cassidy made a bit earlier, and in particular about um, you know, what Council was doing to uh, support the economic recovery of the city and, and keeping the Chamber updated with what was happening. Now, we have a, uh, a website, an economic recovery website, that's accessible via the Brisbane City Council website. It gives a, a very thorough and substantial overview of the uh, various initiatives that we've completed, those that are happening now and that those that are in progress and a, a significant amount of supporting information that um, really depicts um, the amount of activity that Council's undertaking to uh, support the economic recovery of the city. So um, what I would suggest to uh, Councillor Cassidy is to, to have a close look at that page. Um, from time to time, we will bring items to the chamber here for discussion, as Councillor Adams did today with the Brisbane Business Hub. And uh, I think that in the context of this administration, we're focused on getting on with things and delivering rather than talking about these things. Now, turning to the report, there was a uh, committee presentation uh, which covered uh, a regular uh, presentation that we received that looked at the global economy, the domestic economy, and then uh, ultimately the state um, outlook. Uh, it also covered a number of the COVID-related initiatives that the federal and state government have instituted in uh, recent months. And uh, certainly the, the outlook is still uncertain. Uh, but there are some rays of hope. The uh, interest rate outlook remains subdued, so I guess if you're a, a home buyer, that's a good thing, but if you're a self-funded retiree, perhaps less so. But uh, certainly the, uh, the outlook at the moment is still a bit uncertain, but there are some uh, green shoots on the horizon, I suspect. Um, there was also a, um, a report there, once again, on cash investments and funding and a second report, the uh, Bank and Investment Report for August 2020. In addition to that, there were three petitions uh, which primarily related to the opening prayer and the uh, welcome to country that we have at the uh, commencement of council meetings, and I'll leave further debate to the chamber. Further speakers? Any further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Um, I might just reset this clock. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Just really briefly on the petitions, I. Um, probably won't surprise anyone to learn that I, I don't think it's necessary to force councillors to sit through a prayer at the start of council meetings, and I think it would be preferable if councillors were free to pray in their own time. Um, I obviously have no objection to councillors praying before a meeting, but I don't think it needs to be a formal part of the meeting that everyone is forced to participate in, regardless of whether they practise a given religion or not. Um, and I actually think the majority of Brisbane residents are probably inclined towards that view as well. Um, I'm sure it will come up again and again over the years as a, as a matter of public debate, and I, I expect it's a matter of time um, and a question of, of when rather than if we um, rethink that opening prayer. But 
I would just ask that the Lord Mayor um, and all councillors in this chamber seriously consider how necessary it is to make that prayer mandatory and force everyone to participate in it, as opposed to making it something that happens before the meeting. It, I, I think it would be preferable if councillors who wanted to pray simply gathered together before the meeting and did so, rather than um, all of us being obliged to participate. And I just, as a straightforward request, I'd ask that the mayor consider that and perhaps the chair can also give that some reflection. Um, it's, it's probably not too much to ask. I, I'm always on time for these meetings, but I'd, I'd rather spend that time working than praying. Thank you. Further speakers? Council, Councillor Johnston. Uh, look, that was just not necessary, that comment. Uh, I just rise to speak uh, briefly on the uh, petitions. Um, I have a slightly different approach to Councillor Shri. I, I think there's some um, tradition here. I appreciate not everybody um, wants to do a prayer, and, and certainly I respect his position on this. Um, my position is um, that uh, we should be doing the welcome to country first. Um, I do believe um, it was unfortunate that uh, Councillor Owen um, objected very significantly, I think, and then was very unwilling to really do it. Uh, so I think that we should be acknowledging the traditional owners of the land first, and then a very non-denominational prayer uh, to give us wisdom and guidance, I think, is appropriate. So I would like Council to consider uh, swapping the order, um, and I believe that would be a better way to do it. Further speakers? There being no further speakers, Councillor Allen, I will now put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the consideration of notified motion, please. Uh, the Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, as you pointed out, it's been uh, put forward by a notified motion that this council alter the commencement time of the ordinary meeting uh, ordinary council meeting to be held on Tuesday 3rd of November 2020 from 2 p.m. Uh, to 2.30 p.m. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor that the uh, resolution as written be moved. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? <clears throat> oh, look, very briefly, uh, this is the uh, uh, standard tradition that has occurred uh, year after year for as long as anyone can remember um, to uh, change the starting time for the council meeting uh, on Melbourne Cup Day. Uh, Melbourne Cup is known as the race that stops a nation, or at least pauses a nation. Um, and for many, many years, it's been the race that pauses council for a moment uh, while we gear up half an hour later. Uh, obviously, this doesn't affect any of the business that council does. Um, and as you well know, there's no limit on the time that a council meeting can continue to. Uh, and uh, so if there is further work to be done, that work uh, is simply put back half an hour and can still occur. Um, I know that there are some people that would have an objection to horse racing, uh, and uh, I suspect that we'll hear that shortly, but um, this is uh, a long-standing tradition which we propose to continue. Further speakers? Councillor Shree? Just me again. Um, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll keep it short. All councillors in the chamber know my view that I consider horse racing to be a form of animal abuse, and um, I, I do think it is a cruel and an un unnecessary way to mistreat animals. Um, I think society is moving away from this as well. Um, and, and again, I would just say through you, Chair, to the Lord Mayor, that just because something is a tradition or we've always done something a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't reevaluate those traditions and critically reflect on them. Um, parties that ca claim to be progressive or to support so-called progress might do well to reflect on the fact that social standards and norms can change <coughs> over time. Um, and if we said just, just because something's a tradition doesn't mean that... Um, well, I, I think it speaks for itself. The, the, the idea that we should do something just because we've always done it isn't a sound, logical argument. Um, and, and if the mayor is, is so certain that horse racing is something that the general public is really supportive of and, and is confident that it doesn't cause any harm to the animals involved, um, then, then he ought to defend the practice on that basis rather than on the basis that it's simply tradition and we've always done it that way. But certainly I won't, I won't be celebrating the Melbourne Cup. I'll be um, reflecting on how cruel that um, so-called tradition is and, and how unnecessary it is. 
Further speakers? Yep. Councillor Johnston. Yes, just briefly on the motion. Um, I said this last year. We just do not need to start the meeting later. I don't necessarily agree with Councillor Shree, but I respect his um, views on this. Um, look, you don't, we don't need to start later. The rest of the world has to get on with work and life. Um, we do not need uh, to delay the council meeting for the purposes of a horse race in Melbourne. Um, I think it's unnecessary. Further speakers? I see no further speakers, the Lord Mayor. I'll now put the resolution, all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Those against, please say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Councillors, uh, I'm gonna ask for petitions, but before I do, there is one minor change I'm gonna ask you to uh, do for this process while we're still in the COVID period, and that is um, please leave the petition on your desk and uh, Mr Piers will collect it after the meeting rather than have him collect it from you, as is tradition. It's just, a, please just respect this minor change. Um, it will uh, occur ordinarily, but this is just one way to make sure that, the, that the, a level of distancing occurs through this period. Councillors, are there any petitions? Yeah. Councillor Howard. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition requesting council trial removing motor vehicles from the Ring Road in New Farm Park. Councillor Adamant. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got a petition from 163 signatories asking for a safe pedestrian crossing at Brookville Road. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition for the urgent funding and installation of a duck ramp at Norman Park. Councillor Griffiths. Yes, thanks, Mr Chair. I have a uh, request for a dog, dog off leash area at Maruka. Councillor Shree. Chair, I've got two petitions regarding local area traffic management around West End and Highgate Hill. Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, series of petitions, 125 signatures in total uh, in relation to concerns about uh, reduction of the amount of car parking spaces in the Wyndham Central business area. Thank you. Are there any other petitions? May I please have a resolution to accept them? Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee's concern for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hutton, seconded by Councillor Griffith, that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concern for consideration and report. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. And those against, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. I will begin. Councillors, are there any statements required as, re as a result of an Office of the Independent Assessor or Councillor Ethics Committee order? Councillors, are there matters, any matters of general business? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise tonight to speak on the fourth anniversary and the legacy of Manmeet <coughs> Alicia, also known as Manmeet Sharma, to the City of Brisbane. I would like to also tonight use part of my speech to speak in Punjabi as a matter of respect to Manmeet. Satsri Kal, Vahegraji Kakalsa, Vahegraji Kafate. I rise tonight to remember and pay tribute to the legacy of Manmeet Alicia, who some in our city knew as Manmeet Sharma. In Manmeet's home village of Alicia, there is a tree that was planted when he was taken home. And I trust that that tree grows strong today, as does his legacy here in the city of Brisbane. Manmeet's legacy in this city continues to be strong despite the fact that four years have rapidly passed. He is sadly missed by his many friends and his many colleagues, particularly the bus drivers and the taxi drivers throughout our city. At this difficult time, our hearts here in Brisbane go out to the other side of the world, to his family, his father Ramji, his mother Krishnaji, his brother Amit, Amit's family. And I will never forget the day that Krishnaji was holding her grandson, Amit's son, in her arms and she said to me, I can't wait for him to grow up and grow a beard because I think he will look just like Manmeet. 
Manmeet had a very strong legacy in this city. He was well known right across the city for epitomising what it is to earn and demonstrate the benefits of an honest living. And he also practised the values of humanitarianism. He was known to many young people as being someone they could go to if they needed assistance when they were first coming here to Australia. He was always willing to give them a friendly smile, a bit of advice, but also reach out to them in friendship. Manmeet was a poet, he was a singer, he was an actor, he was a bus driver, he was a taxi driver, he was a broadcaster on 4EB, he also had sessions with Radio Brisvani. He was part of the Indoz Theatre Group. He also had dabbled in producing three movies in Punjabi. He was very much a shining light. He was known for his wonderful shining smile and he was a regular performer at many, many Punjabi melas. And in fact, two weeks before he was tragically taken from us, Manmeet and I were both at the same Punjabi Mela at Rockley Showgrounds, and he was literally on the stage before I went on the stage. And I still recall seeing those young children flocking to him. They were captivated with him, and he had that very special charisma. His performance at that Mela and at many others proved that he was a true Put Punjab da, which means a true son of Punjab. I know that he loved his family immensely. And with the COVID restrictions this year, I know it will be incredibly hard, particularly for Amit, his brother, who has been here every year for the anniversary, to pay honour and respect to his brother. Amit has come here each year to ensure that he can share the, rem the memories with Manmeet's friends, with his colleagues, but also be at the place where his brother is honoured. I know Ramji continues to cherish Manmeet's words that he wrote in his poem, Bapai Tera Kake Komon Joga Hoge. These words are very special from a father to a son, oh, sorry, from a son to a father who he cherished immensely. And I know that these are words that will continue as that legacy. Lord Mayor, I know you reflected earlier today on the day that we found out of that horrible incident. I recall it clearly because I was sitting directly opposite you and next to the Lord Mayor at the time. And I know it shook us all. And I'm sure that everyone who knew Manmeet in whatever way they did, whether it was small or a strong relationship, always will remember where they were, what they were doing, when they heard the news on that day. They will remember the shock, the horror, the disbelief, and the absolute grief that came at the tragic loss of a beautiful soul. This is a very, very deep felt day the anniversary, which is tomorrow, in the history of Brisbane. It was an event that we had never experienced before. And to Manmeet's family, we give the undertaking that Manmeet will never be forgotten by our city. And can I say, Terakake koi vinahepura kasakara. For Manmeet, your presence can't be filled by anyone.
Vahegurji Kekalsa, Vahegurji Kefate. Thank you. Further speakers? There being no further speakers, I declare the meeting closed. Good night, everyone. Oh, mate. I'm, I'm sorry, mate.